So first, ladies and gentlemen, may I uh, thank you for your presence uh, at this uh, uh, traditional New Year conference of uh, the uh, ALDE. And first of all, uh, Happy New Year, naturally, and my best wishes to uh, all of you uh, for 2015, not only the members of our group, of the staff members of our group, but also the members of the other groups, first of all, who are present uh, in, uh, uh, in, in this uh, conference. Uh, welcome to this. We have uh, chosen this year the topic of uh, relaunching the uh, economy of the European Union. And more precisely, uh, we, we're going to try this, uh, this afternoon to answer the question how to overcome uh, the investment gap uh, in the European Union, because as we all know that uh, after seven uh, years uh, of uh, uh, stagnation, uh, the time has come uh, to uh, make the European economy work uh, again. And uh, you won't be surprised that as a group we have tried ourselves to give an answer uh, to, that, uh, to that question. Um, uh, from the beginning, we have always uh, been on, uh, of the opinion uh, that to overcome this crisis, uh, we need to have an agenda that uh, combines uh, fiscal consolidation uh, and uh, uh, growth uh, policies. Uh, we have uh, launched uh, an, an, an initiative mid-November last year uh, to uh, launch and relaunch uh, this uh, growth uh, track uh, with the so-called European Investment and Recovery Act uh, because uh, we believe that to uh, kickstart uh, the uh, economy, uh, it's not by creating more debt uh, on the national level uh, that we're going to uh, succeed, but by attracting savings, uh, investments, uh, and by also using the potential of the uh, European market. So our proposal was based on three pillars. Uh, first of all, a European investment fund based on European collateral uh, to attract uh, private investments. Secondly, uh, a European tax stimulus uh, for households and small and medium uh, business and companies uh, with the help of uh, member states. And the third uh, element of our proposal of the uh, Recovery Act was an opening up of the markets of the future. Uh, and we know these markets, energy market, digital market, and so on. An investment plan only will not get the European economy out of the crisis, uh, in our opinion. Therefore, we need also a bold, uh, and for that we look also to the Commission, a bold legislative package to cut red tape, uh, to integrate uh, the capital markets in Europe, to complete the single market, to build up an EU uh, energy community, to accelerate the uh, digital single market. And so we welcome that the new Commission has announced that it will work on proposals in this respect. Uh, but I want only uh, to stress uh, one concern uh, from our group, is that we have no time to waste uh, because the crisis is uh, still uh, very present. Uh, some politicians, uh, dear uh, colleagues and uh, uh, dear friends, are speaking again of the prospect that Greece could, or some are even saying, should uh, leave uh, the uh, euro. Uh, and I and would, uh, would like to remind that we are not only a, a European, uh, an economic community in Europe. We are also a community based on values, and I think that Europe stands for hope and prospects for its citizens and, and is not based on paternalism. It's not up to outsiders, in my opinion, uh, to tell the Greek how to vote. That could be very counterproductive, in my opinion, and it is uh, yeah, the democratic choice of the Greek people who to vote for. But even if we were only uh, an economic community, this proposal uh, to let it open that there could be a Brexit is not, in my opinion, very clever. A Greek default uh, on its around 240 billion euro of rescue loans would send yet another shock wave through 
the uh, euro area. And the guarantees that has been given in the past by member states will become cashable. Ireland, for example, will need to find some 3 billion euros if a Brexit uh, happened and the default of Greece. Portugal uh, need to find some 6 billion. Spain need to find some 29 billion euros. Uh, Italy, some 44 billion euros. France, some 49 billion of euros. And Germany, something between 66 and 80. So it, the, 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 uh, the specialists are not very united on if it is 66 or 80 billion, but it's something between 66 and 80. And while this will be a serious threat to the economic recovery of most of the countries, uh, the government of the latter would simply tell its citizens, well, okay, there is no alternative. Uh, it's the Greeks' fault that you now have to pay 80 billion uh, euros. But there is, in my opinion, an alternative. The alternative is not to continue or to restart a discussion about uh, uh, countries leaving uh, the Eurozone. The alternative is to talk seriously about a bold growth agenda for the whole Eurozone and for the whole European Union. Uh, when we invited for today's conference, uh, the economic situation has been uh, slightly brighter, but now we will need to discuss how to relaunch the EU economy under the sword of Damocles of a Grexit, also under the renewed threat to the integrity of the Eurozone area, uh, and therefore for the uh, financial stability of a whole. And I think that in this uh, light, uh, if you allow me, uh, and I say to all the panelists, uh, we shall also need to address questions such as, yeah, what kind of measures we further need to strengthen uh, the euro area and to build a real economic and monetary union. Second question, how we can avoid a Japanese winter with deflation looming at the horizon if it is not already there, deflation. <laughs> what does the fall of energy prices mean for the European recovery? What does it mean that the European Central Bank cannot use its primary tool of adjusting the interest rate anymore um, as it is circling around the zero lower bound for the moment? What else has the ECB in its toolkit. Uh, what can we expect uh, from a possible decision on the 22nd of January on quantitative easing? And is it a sound policy uh, if we use quantitative easing uh, to buy government bonds, government bonds uh, implying that actual reform efforts are not worth the paper they are, are, are written on? And is it not better if we talk about quantitative easing, to concentrate on self on corporate bonds and finance directly uh, the European economy uh, with such a tool. It are only a few questions uh, that I'm putting, well, not so many, I think it were five or six uh, uh, of them, and in the beginning of the year you can do that. And by the end of the year it's forbidden, but by the beginning of the year you can do that. And I hope that these questions will also be tackled uh, in this uh, conference because uh, all these elements make part of the environment, the crucial environment in which we live today uh, in Europe and we are directly linked to this uh, investment strategy uh, that uh, uh, we need. So talking about uh, a serious growth agenda, I think we have uh, put together uh, a panel of uh, keynote speakers uh, that is very important. First of all, the Vice President of the European Commission, Jirki Katainen. Welcome, Jirki, in, uh, in this liberal group. Uh, in fact, you need it always to be here. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I am sure that you will promote uh, the, uh, for us the, the Commission investment plan of uh, 315 billion uh, uh, euro uh, that uh, has been uh, launched uh, the, the, the last month. Uh, by uh, the Commission, uh, um, and uh, for that reason we have also invited uh, a second keynote speaker, 
I am very uh, happy to welcome uh, today the, the Polish Minister of Finance, Mr. Matthias Czurek. Welcome, Minister. He has been uh, nominated as, uh, as the best Minister of Finance of uh, the European Union. I think it's because he is outside the Eurozone that he has been uh, uh, nominated for that. And he has also a plan of 700 billion, so more nearer to our proposals of the Alde Group. Uh, yeah. Then I would like also to welcome uh, our, our, our panel who will uh, share with us their views on, on, on the Commission proposal, on uh, the different strategies to relaunch uh, the uh, growth in the European Union. And first of all, I want to uh, welcome Mr. Marcel uh, Freitzer, uh, the Professor of Macroeconomics and the President of the German Institute uh, for economic uh, research. Mr. Major, thank you very much for your, for your presence. <laughs> I would also uh, like to welcome Mrs. Angeline Kemner, um, who is the Chief uh, Finance and Risk Officer of APG, but uh, I, I'm, I, I shall be, you, you shall be very particularly interested in hearing from her, which is the former uh, Chief Investment Officer of uh, APG. And so she was the asset manager, so in, in charge of a portfolio of uh, now worth yeah, 400 billion of euros. So it's more than the investment uh, um, plan of the uh, European Commission. And uh, I think that uh, from her uh, practice of uh, managing 400 billion of, uh, of euros, we can learn something. Uh, thank you very much, Angeline, to be here. Uh, I would like also to welcome uh, Ms. Luc uh, Lucrezia Recklin, who is Professor of Economics of the London, School of the London Business School uh, and uh, uh, also uh, one uh, director of the, the No Costing Economics Limited. Uh, that is, uh, 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 she is an expert on the monetary policy uh, and on the ECB, so maybe we, we, we hear from you how you look to the monetary policy of the European Central Bank and of the decisions uh, that shall be taken in the, in the coming days and the coming weeks. And last but not least, I want also uh, to welcome my old friend Paul de Grauwe, uh, who is now uh, not longer a professor in uh, Leuven. Uh, I'm from Ghent, so that's not a problem at all, uh, but a professor at the London School of Economics and a long-time student of Monetary Union. Monetary unions. Specialism. Thank you very much, Paul, to be here. <laughs> he shall certainly enlighten us how a monetary union in crisis with 18 fiscal policies can work uh, and can continue uh, to exist. So, um, my proposal is that uh, we hear first of all the two keynote speakers, uh, uh, Mr. Katainen and uh, uh, or, uh, the Minister of Finance of Poland. Then I give shortly uh, the, the, the floor to the, uh, to the room to, give, uh, to put a few questions, not too much, because I want immediately to start with the whole panel and uh, to give every panelist the uh, possibility to uh, uh, give their short uh, introduction. And then we have plenty of time to have an in-depth uh, debate uh, afterwards. So, uh, Jirki, I can give you the floor. Uh, to give the first keynote speech of this uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Key. Uh, dear friends from Alde Group, thank you very much for your kind invitation to this event. It's nice to be in Alde Group. I have one cabinet member from Alde family, and we are constantly uh, testing each other which one of us is more liberal. <laughs> so it's uh, also from this point of view, it's nice to be here to, to test how liberal I am, really. <laughs> So, bon année, uh, happy new year to everyone. It's good to see uh, parliamentarians and other, uh, other people back at work. This year will be, the, will be the one, again, in which we have to devise new medicines for creating trust and confidence in order to boost economy and in order to boost private investments. I would like to elaborate or more, more like raise questions and give you some ideas how do I think what we should do and then very shortly present the investment plan and um, not only in this event but uh, just uh, to, to inform the members of the European Parliament 
Uh, if any one of you want to talk more about the details of uh, investment plan, <coughs> don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we are more than happy to, to serve you. So the main problem at the moment is that we don't have, in Europe, we don't have enough jobs and it, it's because of lack of growth and the lack of growth is due, to, due mainly to lack of private investments and private demand. But also due to fiscal policy constraints, uh, we are lacking of public investments and public demand. And it's kind of, we are lacking of almost everything except money. <laughs> Europe is full of money and the companies are wealthier than before, but for some reasons companies are not investing in Europe. So it is not mainly a question of lack of public money. It's partially of lack of public money, but uh, not, this is not the main, main issue. I'm sure we can hear from the other panelists uh, today good advices what should be done in order to encourage private sector to invest in Europe. I have some ideas uh, what are the constraints at the moment, but, uh, but I'm, I'm also willing to learn learn more. There are several reasons for all of those lacks, but uh, one thing is clear, there is no single and simple answer. There's not, there's not the magic wand or simple, simple thing to be done in order to, to boost economic growth and encourage private investments. Instead, I think we have to do several things at the same time. <coughs> The sustainable level of investments would be something like 300 billion per year higher than they are at the moment. We don't need to reach the same level as where we were 2007. Uh, it was like 500 billion higher, or the investments were uh, 500 billion higher level than today, but partially this level was unsustainable due to the housing bubble and, and real estate bubble, in, in especially in some member states. The reasons for, from my point of view, the reasons for lack of economic growth and investments um, lies partially on the lack of supply, partially on the lack of, uh, lack of demand, and also weaknesses in, uh, there are weaknesses in competitiveness the reasons for this varies from country to country. For instance, rigidities in labor market is one of the very common nominator in many European countries. Uh, when asking from private sector, some says that, uh, when asking why they are not investing, some says that because there's no demand. And somebody is saying that because there's no supply. So the situation is more or less like uh, egg and hen. And, and we just have to decide what is the most sustainable way to start solving this egg and hen uh, problem. It is not like a circle, a square circle, but we just have to start working with this. There's also some regulatory uncertainties, especially in some areas which hold back some big investments. Also some uh, political risks in some particular member states uh, are harming the investment climate. Also, especially in some countries, there is a lack of risk financing, especially for SMEs, for those who would like to invest in R&D. But uh, because we are so heavily dependent on bank financing, unlike the Americans, uh, banks usually don't lend capital or equity to the companies who would like to expand their activities. C can you tell any address where small and medium-sized enterprise uh, or entrepreneur uh, could get 8 or 10 million euros if he, entrepreneur himself, would like to expand its activities? In America, the venture capitalists are taking care of those. But unfortunately, in European level, we are lacking of the same culture in a larger scale. And this is one of the issues what we have to solve. We have to create a platform, better platform for venture capital 
and venture capitalists to meet SMEs from various countries. Because the SMEs don't necessarily only need money. They need, many times they need money, but uh, they also need, the, uh, need the, the network of experienced venture capital investors to help to expand their businesses and find partners from different parts of the world. Certainly, there are also shortages in a uh, single market. So basically, we need both national action and European solutions. One, of, uh, one cannot replace another. Let's take a uh, labor market as an example. It is purely, this issue is purely on the hands of uh, member states. Dynamic labor market cannot mean insecure labor market. It cannot mean social dumping. Many times, rigid labor market is very cruel, especially to the un unemployed person. It is very unsocial. So are we bold enough to reform labor market so that it would serve better the interest of people? We need to take care of social model of the Europe, because it's, uh, it's one of the things which brings added value to Europe, comparing to some other markets. Creating equal opportunities for all, creating a um, uh, sense of security. It's one of our core values. And when the reforming labor markets, we cannot re uh, forget this. There are several options to reform labor markets, and the main thing is to copy the best practices, which we can see in various member states. So, so there are good examples. And, and we don't need to lose or change everything. We don't need to lose the, the fundamental values of security and decent jobs when uh, uh, reforming uh, labor market to become more uh, dynamic. We simply cannot afford to lose our time for old fashioned fight between rigid close labor market with un, uh, high unemployment and dynamic, fair, encouraging and safe labor market with high employment. So this is just one of the examples in which uh, member states plays a crucial role. Uh, member states cannot outsource this um, responsibility to the EU. Dear friends, um, economic growth needs a confidence in order to boost confidence, we need growth. So this is an, another example of uh, egg and hen uh, phenomenon. In my mind, confidence comes first. No one will invest if uncertainty is overlapping. No people will consume if the future is uncertain. So we as a policymaker, we have to make sure that our continent and business surrounding and living surrounding is as secure as possible. It doesn't need to be perfect in order to boost investments. But what investors need, they need confidence and they need a, they need a picture that things are going right direction. So I have listed three elements which are crucial for encouraging investments and, and which are in conditions to get more uh, jobs. The first one is the, the, the theme I mentioned, confidence. It means basically that member states, together with the EU, we have to uh, perform trustworthy fiscal policy. If we are lacking of this, we are lacking of confidence. And again, no one is willing to spend their money for long-term investments if the surrounding is, uh, is uh, vulnerable or you cannot uh, expect a level playing field or secure future. So that's why investment and job creation is not contrary to res fiscal responsibility. We cannot see this as a black and white issue. We need both. And there is a kind of uh, uh, reasonable path, which is not the extreme 
in either way. I don't want to go further in, in this fiscal policy because it has been talked that much, quite, quite a lot um, uh, in the past. The second point we need is structural reforms. It varies uh, from country to country. <clears throat> in some countries we are talking about labor market, in some countries we are talking about commodity market, in some countries we are talking about the need to reform uh, pension system, municipality system, healthcare system, and things like that. But structural reforms have very negative um, uh, echo or negative uh, reputation. Sometimes people think that it's always cutting. But in my mind, a structural reform is an, alter is an alternative for budgetary cutting. Because good structural reform creates something new. Budgetary cuttings are only cutting. In my previous jobs, I have done both. I have both cut and raised taxes, and also done, uh, I have done uh, structural reforms. For some reason, budgetary consolidation is easier to do than structural reforms. I don't know why. This is, I, I think it's not a Finland specific case, because it seems to be the same everywhere. But the structural reforms are better because it creates something new. Instead of cutting or raising taxes, kind of raising or, or cutting opportunities. I just want to mention a couple of examples of good structural reforms which could be part of the structural reform package alongside with the pension and labor market. We need to pay attention to the quality of teachers' training. I'm 100% sure if all, the, all our member states would pay more attention to the quality of teachers' training, our continent would be more competitive, more socially coherent, more uh, equal. So this is one of the examples, what, even though the EU itself or the Commission doesn't have competence in this area, I would like to use country-specific recommendations for these purposes. We need better quality education, and precondition for this is better quality teachers' training. Another example of uh, sustainable uh, structural reform is uh, the investments to R&D and university funding. I happen to believe blindly to these areas. You don't never know what you can get out of research investments, but something you can get out. And it's positive. So I also would like to encourage our member states to pay attention to the structures of uh, universities and, and uh, copy the best practices from the member states who are doing the best, who are getting the most out of the university funding, for instance. The third and the final part is the EU action. You already know this, the main features of um, the investment plan. It's like a triangle. The first part is risk financing fund. Uh, you can compare it to EIB. The biggest difference is that the new fund, EFSI, uh, supposed to invest riskier uh, projects and to SMEs. So in other words, to take more risk. Because Europe is, even though I said it's full of money, but it's lacking of risk taking money. In the EF EFSI, there is a first loss guarantee which should encourage private sector to participate to the infrastructure projects, riskier ones, and to SME financing. The fund can also do equity investments to SMEs who are willing to expand. The second part is transparent um, uh, project pipeline. This comes directly from the needs of uh, private investors, at least according my experiences. I've been talking with private investors, probably you know better than I do, uh, but investors have said that um, our duty is to invest in European infrastructure, but there is not enough good and mature and well-structured products, projects. And we want to change this. So at the end of the day, there should be a European transparent pipeline for the projects which are reliable, and you can see what you can get if you invest in those. The third part is single market part. 
This is probably the most important for me personally, even though I'm not in responsible of whole area of uh, single market development. Uh, the areas like public procurement, in which Elspieta Pienkowska is working, my colleague, or digital single market, in which Andros Ansip and Günther Oettinger is working, or energy uh, union, Maro Sefkovic and Mikel Kanyete, capital market union, Jonathan Hill. I do hope that liberal alder, alder group would pay attention to this part of the investment plan because this is unused opportunity for us as a Europeans. Last time when single market were created seriously, we didn't have digital uh, content. Now we have. And for this, and, and because of this fact, we have to create a digital single market. Also, decade ago, we did not see energy as crucial thing for our competitiveness. Energy was more or less like a national thing, not anymore. Also, the capital market have some constraints and shortages. So this is one of the examples in which united, more integrated, deeper integrated Europe can help member states to create economic growth. And especially, it gives new opportunities for private sector to, to, to create whatever they want to create. And we as a policymaker, again, our duty is to facilitate well-educated, hardworking people and entrepreneurs to, to create uh, new Europe. So even though people are paying more attention or they are most interested in this fund part of the investment plan, I would like to highlight the importance of single market part of the plan because it is a European structural reform and we are the ones who can create new opportunities for our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jirki. Uh, Matthäus, can I give you the floor? Well, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation and kind words. I don't really think that uh, the word that you mentioned had anything to do with uh, Euro zone accession or, or not. Uh, it, is, um, it is beginning of, of the new year and, um, uh, and a good time to talk about things that, that matter. And also, uh, it's, worth, um, it's worth looking at what we managed to achieve um, last year in this respect. And one thing that did happen was the beginning uh, or restarting of, of the of discussion about the things that, uh, that really counts, um, how to get growth back. After years of um, shoring up public finances, uh, fixing up banks, um, the, uh, the discussion about growth and what it needs um, started or restarted for good uh, last year. What we managed to achieve was to agree that, uh, well, Europe does lack investments. And, um, uh, and this shortage of investment is, a, uh, is as bad a waste as you can think of. Uh, it means that the growth potential of the European economy is, uh, is wasted. It means that the demand uh, and current activity is suffering, and as a result, uh, and as a result, uh, unemployment is at elevated levels, uh, and and that is the greatest waste of all, uh, of of the big, biggest potential of of the European uh, society and economy. What brought us to this uh, discussion was another disappointment uh, last year. It was a very nice beginning of 2014, uh, and then um, and growth uh, stalling yet again. Um, the economy slowly sliding uh, into uh, into deflation, and well, in Poland we're already there. Uh, in uh, in the eurozone, we're probably already there as well in December, um, and that means that the, uh, that the burden of debt uh, is is heavier on some countries. Uh, the ability to readjust relative prices is more difficult. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the need for action uh, is uh, even greater. Uh, the other thing that we managed to achieve last year uh, was to actually do something concrete. Uh, and I'll mention, first of all, the results of the, of the task force uh, with a uh, list of 
reasonable projects, things that would uh, um, that need to be done. Uh, it would be good to have financed uh, by um, uh, either existing instruments or new instruments in Europe. Uh, we also had a debate on what kind of new instruments uh, would be uh, worth introducing uh, to to break this break out of this uh, stagnation of uh, and, and shortage of, of demand leading into shortage of um, of potential growth. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we've all been in this discussion. There were several voices. Um, Alde uh, had, had one. I, I contributed to this discussion. Uh, and um, and we, um, we managed to, um, to, um, to have to present, uh, and the European Commission uh, uh, proposed uh, the, uh, the, the new the new plan. Jurki uh, mentioned the three main elements of um, uh, of the plan, uh, and I'm happy that uh, well we are putting quite a lot of hope um, in it, and I believe it's it's a great starting point. Uh, it is a starting point, but it's certainly not not the end. Um, and I'll uh, I would like to mention a few things uh, that I believe are are important to to make. Uh, the plan, the initiative, uh, actually have an impact on, on the European economy, European jobs, and um, uh, and how to how can it deal with the threat of, of a lost uh, of a lost generation? Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I we we cannot stop here. Um, it's been a very um, it's been very f fast work in the past few months, um, including the, the work of the task force uh, and European Commission uh, on a very tight schedule between September and, and December. Uh, a concrete proposal has been put on the table uh, and it's been um, given a strong green light by the European Council. Uh, but, but things are moving on in the European economy and European society and not necessarily in the right direction. Uh, deflation I mentioned, uh, political changes uh, which are a natural consequence of elevated unemployment level in a number of countries. Uh, if anything, I'm quite surprised uh, at, the, um, at the fact that uh, European societies are so resilient. Uh, in view of these adverse economic conditions, uh, but the results of um, the results of the uh, European Parliament elections, uh, the um, popularity rating of a number of radical countries within within Europe, show that the the patience is slowly running out, uh, and that means that that we we have to um, that we have to act. Otherwise, the integrity of of the eurozone of the uh, of the EU may be might be put at some stage. Um, in, in question, uh, and if we start hearing about uh, things like freedom of movement of labor being questioned, uh, that is, I mean, if that happens, this is the end uh, of, um, of the Eurozone for sure, because it cannot uh, function without it, uh, and the EU uh, probably would, like to, would, uh, would be likely to follow. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, so it's not a question about you know rhetoric offensive. Um, uh, it's not a question of uh, shoring up expectations and, and hoping that this this will work. Actually, something needs to be uh, needs to be done. I mean, first of all, uh, the European Investment Bank has to um, uh, start working immediately, even before the the final proposal of the European Commission is is ready, uh, as it promised uh, to do, and, and show that um, it can. Um, and change, alter its risk profile uh, in order to stop competing with the private sector, um, uh, which is what, what's happening um, very often right now. I've heard a number of complaints by commercial banks that the European Investment Bank is pretty much stealing all the possible bankable projects that are there in the market, uh, leaving very little room uh, for, uh, for private financing. Now. If the result of the uh, of the new initiative is going to be something like this, 
uh, then it's not going to, we're not going to see more investments. We just see the different source of funding for these investments, and this is going to be it. Um, also, uh, we hope for, uh, an, we have quite high hopes uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the new hub. Uh, the, uh, the, the promised center of expertise, possibly on the ground within some of the member states, uh, that would help uh, the countries and uh, private companies uh, to structure projects uh, in the, so they, be, they become bankable, financeable by, by the new instruments or co-financeable by the private sector, public-private partnership and so forth. Uh, some countries are uh, doing better in this than others. Uh, probably Britain, Italy, doing quite not quite well. In Poland, uh, this expertise. I mean, we're we learning, for example. So this is something that uh, that is uh, that is certainly needed, especially as uh, as slowly um, the, the model of EU uh, co-financing is is moving into into that direction. And so the quicker we learn, um, the more investments we're going to see um, in the in the near term. And secondly. And I think we, we all agree, and uh, in the original proposal uh, of, of the European Commission, there's been, I think, uh, four or five calls, explicit calls for more funding. The FSI is underfunded. Um, it's, uh, it's, the problem uh, I see with it is, uh, is partially the leverage ratio um, and, and the fact that it limits the type of investments it can do. Uh, and I, I take and buy the argument that uh, uh, EIB works on a similar leverage ratios and it's, it's nothing unusual. Well, yes, but it has to, uh, but the, the end result is that it competes with the private sector uh, on, on the same set of projects. Um, so without a further um, capital involvement of, of someone, um, the, uh, we will limit not so much the absolute nominal amount of investable money, but uh, we will uh, limit ourselves to a, to a very specific set of projects, uh, leaving aside ones that are um, both economically <laughs> and socially uh, useful uh, and promoting the third pillar, uh, for example, the, uh, the single market. A number of, uh, of infrastructure projects uh, are have very high externalities are difficult to um, are difficult to um, structure in such a way they would generate cash flow um, uh, and and be uh, it's difficult to make them uh, investable by private sector alone uh, and that means that the capital uh, contribution or equity contribution of the of the public sector has to be a bit higher uh, because the the returns are more evenly distributed among various member states so the question is not so much about the total size of the, of the investment gap, whether it's 300 or 700 billion, um, although I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, it's also about the, what can we achieve and how uh, are we able to avoid the risk of crowding out of private investments. Um, now, about the size of the investment gap, Jürgen mentioned quite rightly that, uh, that in comparisons of the pre-crisis levels and trends, uh, we have to take into account what's been going on in the real estate sector, the fact that clearly some of the uh, things that were going on in some of the countries were unsustainable. Well, yes, but that does not mean that the resources used for, this, uh, for these investments uh, are, uh, are useless. Uh, that means that it could be put to some other use, uh, and that means that investments could be higher just somewhere else, not in the real estate. Um, uh, which means that uh, I would still argue that the overall um, size of the gap uh, is, well, it's certainly not filled by, uh, by, the, uh, by the numbers we're talking about here, and I'm, I'm certainly uh, a bit closer uh, in, in thinking to, to Aldi's uh, proposal of 700 billion. Um, but I think the first, the first part, avoiding crowding out of the, of the, of the private investments, is, is more important than the... Um, than the overall size. Uh, now, the good news is that the, the underfunding can be, um, can be overcome uh, within the structure of the, uh, of the European Commission's uh, proposal. And, and that's, that's something that uh, we're really hoping for. 
because there's a number of elements that are um, uh, very similar to to, uh, uh, to our own Alders in the um, in the final Juncker plan. Uh, the difference is the money. Now, the money can be can be provided with can be provided by the, by the member states, uh, but that. Um, that requires a proper treatment of these guarantees or cash um, uh, payments uh, or paid in capital uh, in a similar way to the ESM, uh, in my view. And I think it's the clearest um, or cleanest way of doing that is to, um, is to create uh, the FSI in such a way uh, that the member states' contributions uh, would not count as deficits uh, as judged by the Eurostat. It's, uh, it's Eurostat's independent decision, uh, but it did, uh, uh, the ESM was done in such a way uh, that it was a financial transaction, it, it was increasing public debt, but it was not increasing budget deficit, uh, and as, as such, we were able to avoid the discussion about watering down of, um, uh, of the Stability and Growth Pact. Uh, and, and this is, uh, uh, this is the, the best um, way to convince uh, the member states to, uh, to pay in more capital and, as a result, unlock uh, more investment capacity of, of, the, new, of the new instrument. Uh, but even before the, the official confirmation by the Eurostat, it will be, it will be good to have a clear, um, a clear picture of what it actually means uh, if I am to commit some money um, into the FSI. Uh, and let me say it again here, uh, yes, Poland would be willing to pay in, provided it's not a loan, um, and, it, and that the, the uh, statistical treatment um, is right. Uh, it is also important to have this done as quickly as possible because uh, I think it's, uh, it's also, it would be also useful to have as many countries on board as possible. Why? Because it will make the governance structure uh, easier. Um, you know what to do with uh, with someone that is uh, uh, that is trying to free ride uh, all the other countries. Uh, would such a country have the same say in all the uh, all the structures of the FSI? Uh, this is this is a question that we need to uh, address, uh, and it will be easier to address these questions uh, if there are more contributors. Um, the um, I think. The, the proposal and the result of the last year's deliberations, they, they, they are very useful uh, and promising uh, sign that things are, are changing um, f uh, for, uh, for the better. There are, there are a lot of things that could be done in Europe to make the common market work better, uh, and there is no better time to do it than now. Uh, with yields at zero in a number of countries, below zero in others, um, uh, and uh, with very few exceptions, uh, are close to record lows. Uh, this is this is the time uh, to do things that help the European economies to grow, expand, uh, and prosper in, in the years to come. Uh, it will be certainly worse later on down the line. So let's let's do it as quickly as possible. Um, now, I think it's just concluding. I think it's worth also considering the FSI as a, as a permanent um, sort of integral element of the, of the stability and, and growth pact uh, for, um, for, years, for years to come. And let me, let me explain what, I'm, uh, what I mean here. I mean, we, today we, we know for certain that stability and growth pact must be respected and must be um, enforced uh, fully, in, especially in, in good times, and cruelly in, in good times. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think the problem with, which we have in, with stability and growth back today is that it's becoming unenforceable uh, in bad times. There's something wrong with it uh, if, if we see countries essentially ignoring SGP and getting away with it, uh, and others not so much. Uh, this is unacceptable, um, and uh, the way to do it is to strengthen it, uh, but at the same time, uh, allowing um, uh, allowing uh, to break free from this uh, from this situation where uh, where the money is abundant, as Jurki was saying, uh, the needs are there, 
as shown by the, by the task force, by the, uh, by the investment gap, but at the same time, uh, Europe as a whole, uh, unable to, um, to mobilize these idle savings into, into productive investments. Um, and, and the way to do it is exactly via capital contributions to FSI, um, which, which would, um, and, and then um, strict uh, enforcement of the stability and growth packs at the member state, uh, at member state level. Um, so that, that is the way to, to provide more counter-cyclical uh, fiscal policy, because let's face it, uh, we'll be discussing it, this in a second, uh, the, the room for, uh, for, um, for meaningful change or boost the impulse for investments by, uh, by the ECB right now is, um, is quite limited. We reached the level where, uh, reached the stage where uh, zero bound is, uh, is binding uh, and now it's probably too late. Uh, and, and the uh, sort of focus is now on uh, on member states, on fiscal and structural policies, rather than uh, rather than on uh, on monetary policy. So let me um, let me stop uh, stop here and wish you all uh, a great and prosperous uh, new year. And let's get to work. Thank you. Before opening the, uh, the and giving the floor to the panelists. Uh, I take two, three questions, not more than that. Uh, so we're going to be very strict on that. Pavel, you uh, have raised your hand as the first already before the start of the meeting. Is that okay? Uh, in fact, even uh, yesterday. Yesterday already. Uh, yes, also a uh, happy new year from my side. Uh, uh, looking at Vice President Katain and I need to say it's good to have uh, real liberals in the commission. Uh, very much appreciate uh, the emphasis that you have put on the uh, two other pillars, uh, the non-financial ones in, uh, in uh, the investment plan, underlining that uh, without a real progress on the two, uh, where, wherever needed, going deeper and abolishing also, in addition to that unnecessary and burdensome legislation, it would be a waste of money. I also appreciate the emphasis that you have made on the structural reforms to be conducted. Uh, I have already raised that uh, once in the plenary, and I would appreciate your comment on it. If you see still a way of introducing conditionality between uh, the financial benefits, to cut it short, and the structural reforms needed in the member states. I have uh, one issue in mind uh, where it worked very well with the candidate countries, uh, including the Czech Republic years ago. We had these regular reports uh, on an annual basis uh, that were assessing ourselves uh, in terms of the, the rapprochement to the Commission. It was always extremely sensitive, hectic, uh, demanding. I must say that uh, the whole political representation was keen on doing well. And I wonder whether uh, we could not uh, find an inspiration in this respect because uh, at the end of the day, that would be the necessary tool for the Commission with which it could really encourage the structural reforms which are not occurring in some of the member states. Thank you. Sophie, and then Danuta, and then I stop already. It's quick. Two ladies. <laughs> um, no, thank you. I've, I've listened with great interest, um, and I think one of the key words that was mentioned here is trust. Uh, and trust is never put in figures. Trust is put in leadership. Trust is put in ambition. Um, and I, I think, and it was mentioned by the minister, that... Um, in particular, national governments are sending out very mixed signals about their trust in the European Union. Uh, and that doesn't help winning the trust of the citizens. Um, and, and I think that's key. We can talk about you know, funds and how much money or how many guarantees and what are we going to do with it. But unless people trust the European Union to do the job, you know, it doesn't really matter how much money we're go going to put into it. So how are we going to break away from this... Uh, a perverse cycle within the council and the member state governments that they're talking on the one hand about Europe uh, having to resolve these problems uh, and talking about funds and plans for the future and at the same time saying we don't trust Europe, we want to, to make it smaller, uh, we, we want to end uh, free movement, we basically want to break up the single market. So which one is it? And I think the Parliament and, and, and the new Commission are pretty clear about their ambition. Um, but I think it's now for the Council to send out a very clear and unambiguous message. And how do you think 
um, from your insider's perspective, how can we achieve that? Because I really think it's essential. Uh, Danita, the cha yeah. chairman of the AFCO. Thank you, the but parliament. if you allow me not on AFCO this time, so I would just... Uh, I, I Future am, member of the group, maybe. Right. I have been <laughs> terribly, strongly surprised when I heard from the Polish minister how the EIB is really crowding out the private projects, because this is a question that has been coming back and forth uh, over the last years. Each time we had a meeting with EIB, we were asking this question, and we always had a, a, a long sort of speech on how it is not the case. So I, I'm surprised. Do we have any evidence on this? This is quite an interesting question. And, and then I don't, don't see how you can just avoid this also in the future. My second question is on this one, to follow up on what Pavel said, because I think this, this lack of commitment um, uh, machinery mechanism uh, to make member states really enter into structural reforms, especially on labor market, this is something that we are all suffering from. And to what extent, and how can you use this instrument to, to have this commitment and implementation uh, of these structural reforms? Because the project that would come, that would be financed, would be based would be bankable, sort of based on excellency criteria, cross-border projects. How can you use this to, as a conditionality to, to do it? And the last question, as Oli is here, Oli Ren, I, I remember that we had this discussion on, on uh, getting out from the calculation of the excessive deficit procedure, the co-financing to cohesion policy funding. Uh, we, we moved some, 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 somehow a little bit forward on this, but definitely it was, there was no appetite for this. Now we are proposing it on a much larger scale, and I think you, then you would not be able to exclude also the cohesion policy funding, because it's basically the same type of, 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 of challenge. So I, I, I don't see it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mat Matthias, may, may I start with, uh, with you to respond? And, and can, can you take also the... Uh, what, what's your reaction on, on the idea that the ECB could enter in the EFSC as a, as a way to, to uh, make progress in this? You can play Mario Draghi for once, maybe, uh, yeah. a few moments. Uh, uh, because that could be the boost eh, to, 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 to have it. If we do, if we do uh, QA in, in, on the 22nd in January, in what we do it? Well, the last question is quite difficult for me, not being, uh, you know, presenting in country not within the eurozone. Uh, oh, so uh, this you is are totally free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no one else can answer. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, be before that, uh, that question can be answered. I, I think um, uh, I think we need to have the FSI up and going. Uh, first, how it how it works? What's the you know, what what are the exact um, you know specifics before anyone can commit to it? Uh, even me, uh, you know, outside of the, um, uh, uh, of the governing uh, council, uh, trust uh, and confidence. Let me um, let me let me say. Uh, one thing, uh, back in late 2012, early 2013, when I was not in the government yet, I was in the, in the banking sector at that time, and I was listening to, um, to the Polish finance minister's uh, presentation at that time, uh, and I was quite surprised in a positive way about a change of focus, because the typical investor's presentation of, um, on the road shows uh, is, that, okay, how are we going to cut uh, or keep budget deficit low and uh, you know what taxes are going to uh, are we going to hike and, and what not that's the, that's the typical story and then uh, in 2012 2013 when there was a European economy slump uh, and also quite a severe slowdown in the Polish economy then most of the presentation was about the growth enhancing instruments guarantees for SMEs uh, a number of uh, number of things and about the fiscal stimulus very little and that was very refreshing in a sense that I mean, this, this is something that, that's really shoring up confidence. I don't care about whether, you know, about uh, the deficit, whether it's uh, two or three or four uh, or five. I, what I care about is the denominator. Uh, if the country is able to pay back its old debts uh, and uh, avoiding a recession is the way to do that. And going back to your question, how to win trust and confidence in the European Union, well, I suppose results. Um, are we able are the current set of policies really um, uh, inspiring confidence uh, in, the, in the economy? Because this is what really matters. I mean, and Paul de Grauwe has been writing about this, you know, what made the, you know, what made the yields go down 
um, after Mario Draghi's uh, whatever it takes. Was it uh, a fiscal stance? Not so much, not at the time. Uh, it's, of course it matters, it matters for Greece, it matters at the, at the extreme, uh, but, uh, but growth also matters, and that, that's, the, that's the secret of, of the Polish success and the fact that we grew 20% since 2007, is that we cared about the, about the structural policies and the supply side, uh, but also the, uh, the investment uh, the side of the equation, and, and the end result was that, well, yes, the budget deficit has been a bit above average of Europe, but the public debt growth compared to GDP was the second smallest in Europe. Uh, so I think uh, the way to win trust and confidence uh, is to have growth back uh, and review all the policies that we have in place uh, from, from that respect. Uh, and about, about the um, crowding out, uh, I think that the proper uh, person or, or group of persons to answer that is, is the private sector and private banks. I have anecdotal evidence on a number of occasions I've, I've heard that a number of banks uh, I admit I don't have a very solid research on that done, uh, but, but we, I think we, we should be able to, uh, to get this from, from, from commercial banks. Jirki. Thank you. First, uh, about the conditionality, if I understood your question right, uh, you meant that if, uh, if, if a country could get financing from the EFSI, there should be some kind of macroeconomic conditionality. Is, is that your question? Yeah. So. Um, we were considering this opportunity too, but um, then we decided that the projects which uh, can get financing from the EFSI, it should be, the selection should be politi uh, pol uh, political free. So, I mean, um, basically uh, the projects like infra structural projects could be viable in order to get uh, financing. And we did not want to mix uh, political decision making to this viability vi assessment, even though it's not us, it's the fund itself who is doing the assessment. But this was the feedback from private sector that the simpler the selection of the project or the assessment is, the more trustworthy it is and it helps the private sector to step in. This was our uh, idea. I was considering policy, uh, policy, macroeconomic policy conditionality because it would make sense, but it, there would have been a risk of mixing too many things together and, and then, because uh, as I said earlier, the Europe is full of money, but it's not used for productive investments and what we want to do is not to replace uh, private sector money by public sector money because it would make any sense. Instead, we want to establish a new fund which could take more risk than EIB or than the private sector is willing to do or take. So, so uh, the selection of the pro process uh, projects should be as simple as, as possible. Um, one additional comment to single market. Um, this is kind of political point, uh, what I want to raise. Um, there is no one single law which will create digital single market. I'm not the special uh, or the best specialist in this field, Anders Ansip and, and Oettinger knows more about this, but um, it's a series of uh, proposals. Uh, I could imagine that there is a copyright, copyright regime uh, proposal, there is uh, maybe harmonized VAT base, maybe uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, proposals and things like that. And all of those are very critical in order to create a uh, harmonized single market. And we, as politicians, we should keep this in our mind. They are not just one piece or one proposal, but they are part of the entity. And the members of the European Parliament, the members of the Commission, we have to encourage member states to understand this entity also. You cannot create single market by launching one law. Instead, it, it is a series of uh, different proposals. And if we really want to create something uh, like a uh, digital single market, um, we, we have to keep this big picture in our mind. And my final point is, <coughs> imagine um, the spirit, even though I was not in, in politics at that time, but the, what I have studied, the spirit of Delors 
Commission's uh, Single Market Act 1 and 2. It was creating new Europe. There was not borderline between the member states. Neither is today. I mean, there is no borderline between South and, uh, South and North when creating digital single market. Even those who are skeptical towards European integration, they are usually in favor of, uh, of uh, a single market. So this would be the first time for a long time when we could take everybody on board, all the member states, uh, many political groups, even those who are skeptical towards European integration, and create something new. So let's use this momentum as an opportunity to, to build better Europe. I'm going to first start with uh, the, the, the panel discussion, giving the floor to our panelists, and then I uh, give immediately the floor to, the, to, the, uh, to all those who are present. Not all those who are present, I hope, but uh, some who are present. And I give first of all, Mr. Fletcher, can I give you the floor uh, so that you can give what the recommendations are of the German Institute of Economic Research? Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I want to basically, in my few minutes I have, make one key point, that is that we, to think about how we can overcome the crisis, we really need to think about how we can coordinate a different policy areas, policy arenas, and only if you really have a grand bargain combining different, uh, different areas of economic policy uh, can we overcome the crisis. If, uh, the first slide, please, could be, could be put in. Um, so essentially, to think about the crisis we have today, we are, we are still in the, uh, in the European crisis. We, we need to think of four different crises. It's not just an economic crisis with high unemployment, low growth, a big collapse in economic activity since 2008, but also we have a, a debt crisis with a lot of sovereigns, but also a lot of corporates, at least in some countries, being highly indebted. We still have to think of a banking crisis where a lot of banks still not are able to do their job of passing on credit uh, to the private sector, in particular to small and medium-sized enterprises, and of course a confidence crisis we, we now discussed uh, in detail already. And the point is, whenever you think of solving one of those four crises, and if you think of the investment program that we have, or the, the proposal and the, the plan, the European uh, investment plan by the Commission, um, surely this can address partly the economic crisis, trying to generate demand, generate um, growth, but still, it's much harder to, to make this program effective if you still have these other crises in place, if there's still the debt crisis and still the banking crisis, because a lot of um, what needs to be done to overcome the crisis means we need to have, um, for instance, more credits to the private sector. So if the banking system doesn't function, pass on the credit, it's much harder to generate higher uh, private investment uh, in the euro area, and the same about the debt crisis. If companies are over indebted, it's much harder for them to really generate uh, investment, therefore generate growth um, via higher em employment and uh, productivity. So the question is how can we combine those four in thinking about overcoming the crisis? We need to address all four of them. Now, I think the European investment plan by the Commission is really in a very important step in the right direction for three reasons. It really identifies the issue that we need to generate more growth, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, investment addresses the two elements that we have, uh, or the two sides of the uh, economic equation, both on the supply side and the demand side. And in Germany, we oftentimes have somewhat of an obsession with the supply side, thinking structural reforms can Go, go all the way, and this is sufficient to overcome the crisis. In some other countries, there may be more focus on the demand side, and I think the, the issue of investment is so important because it addresses both the supply side, so improving productivity, thereby generating uh, employment, uh, higher income, uh, and growth, and it addresses also the demand side in the short term, uh, so I think this is one of the strengths. Uh, moreover, um, I think also the focus on small and medium-sized enterprises is a very important element because that's exactly where we see some of the credit crunch uh, and the credit constraints in Southern Europe. Uh, and after all, 70 to 80 percent of employment in particular in Southern Europe uh, comes from small and medium-sized enterprises. It doesn't come from, from big companies. And the third element, which is very important in the Commission proposal, uh, is a focus on deregulation, making function, mar markets function better. Um, uh, improving competition and thereby providing incentives for private for the private sector uh, to invest more. Now, looking at the investment gap that we have talked about, and uh, now I'd like to show the next slide, please. Um, we at DRW Berlin tried to calculate how big is this investment gap for different euro area countries, 
This is based on an economic model where we basically try to consider also the structure of an economy, how big is the industry, what sectors does an economy have, what's the initial capital stock, what's the productivity level, also demographics, and based on that we ca try to calculate how big is the investment gap. So should the, the economy as a whole, private and public investment, uh, have a higher rate of investment relative to GDP? Uh, the first column shows it for the entire period, 1990 to 2012, the second for the pre-global crisis period, and the last column uh, for the latest period, 2010 to 2012. And if you look at the third block of countries, you clearly see for many of the program countries uh, and crisis countries, here you have a big gap, so a positive figure means there is too little investment, um, and this is sizable, in some cases around 1% and, and up to 3 or 4%. But the interesting thing, uh, about this finding is the first row, uh, is for Germany. So even though Germany doesn't share a lot of the difficulties I described on, on the debt crisis, uh, on the banking system, Germany is actually one of the countries with the highest investment gaps, with one of the lowest investment rates in the entire euro area, not just among uh, the euro area, but among OECD countries. And here the gap is 3.7% of GDP. When I mentioned this figure in Germany, there's an uproar saying this is a huge gap. We're talking about 100 billion euros that Germany is investing too little. But if you compare to the current account surplus, that's the net saving of the entire economy, this is about twice the size. So all this is saying is if Germany invested half of that surplus uh, in the form of private and public investment, Germany could strengthen growth, could generate demand, uh, improve productivity, and so on. So, so far to the figures, and now I'd like to show uh, the next uh, slide, um, and please one further, um, um, where we try to look at the sectors. Um, clearly, in construction, it's hard to say that uh, there is a, uh, a gap in investment. We have probably had too much investment in, in construction, private and public uh, construction, before the global financial crisis. But if you look at the first three sectors, you see um, that they are very closely linked to the public sector. So the lowest or the biggest investment gaps where the investment was the lowest or collapsed the most was education, healthcare, and the public sector more generally. So these are areas, these are sectors that are very closely linked uh, to the public sector. Um, now if you could go please to the slide after next, so one more please. Um, the third point on investment I want to make is we're not just talking about tangible investment, but also about intangible investment. So in many sectors we have that investment gap, and in particular, if you look at research and development, if you look at the buildup of intangible capital, um, you see that this, um, surely the capital stock of intangibles has increased, but compared to other advanced economies, in particular to the United States, we are falling behind further and further. On the left, this is a level um, of um, intangible capital, or the capital coefficient, compared to the United States, and on the right-hand side is the change. So on both uh, elements, uh, the euro area is lagging behind the United States by a wide margin. Now to the next slide, please. Um, so clearly, if you think of um, this issue of the investment gap, this is not just an issue of the crisis countries, it's much, wide, much more widespread. In particular, Germany has a big gap in this regard. Um, now, how can we overcome that? Uh, I mentioned the European uh, Investment Plan and the Commission um, is a very important step in the right direction. Clearly, we need uh, a lot more structural reforms, uh, including in Germany, to improve the incentives for investment. But one of the big issues, or big question marks to me, is what the role of fiscal policy should be. Uh, and clearly, uh, the Commission has emphasized again and again that we don't want to have more public debt. Uh, but clearly, I think we need to think of the composition uh, of uh, fiscal spending. Um, and um, as I showed you in some of those charts, if you look at the uh, investment gap, it's not just an issue of a private sector gap, but it's also an issue of public sector uh, gap. And again, to give you an example of Germany, in the 1970s you had a share of public investment in the federal budget of around 13 to 14 percent. Today the share is close to 8 percent. So we have had seen a huge shift away from public investment since the 1970s towards public consumption uh, and public investment being squeezed more and more over time. And clearly um, that happening means uh, that um, you have less um, also productive uh, capability. And in particular, if you look at the interrelation between public and private investment, um, you see a very important complementarity. If you talk to German companies why they're investing so little, it's not as 
uh, Mr. Katayan confirmed this, is not that they have too little cash, but they basically will say uncertainty is very high. We lack skilled workers that we need uh, for our production process. We lack a good digital infrastructure or public transport infrastructure. So many areas that are basically in the responsibility of the public sector. So there is this very important complementarity between public and private investment, and clearly we need to find ways to improve private investment, but one important precondition for that is improve public investment, in particular in areas such as education, uh, healthcare, uh, infrastructure in the broadest sense, but also uh, education and healthcare, as I mentioned. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, and again, if you can jump over that and go to the next, to the final slide, the role of monetary policy. So I emphasized the importance of structural reforms and uh, fiscal policy, the composition of fiscal policy and public investment. Uh, and clearly monetary policy does play a very important role as well. It uh, came up in the earlier discussion already. And the question what the ECB can do, essentially the ECB has pulled all the levers it could uh, except one, and this is the second to last point, and this is the, uh, the purchase of sovereign debt. And I think this is the only or the last option, the last policy tool the ECB has left, uh, first of all, to fulfill its mandate, which is far from, uh, far from realizing, far from fulfilling. Uh, where it's still far away from uh, reaching the um, inflation rate of, of close uh, but below 2%. And most importantly, the ECB is risking losing its credibility because inflation expectations have essentially become unanchored. Markets, companies don't trust that the ECB will be able to achieve its mandate over the medium term. Now, the ECB clearly um, knows what it has to do, um, and I think we all expect that there will be some announcement on this 22nd of January towards um, a government uh, debt purchase program, sovereign debt purchase program. Um, but clearly, um, if we want to make this program effective, we essentially need to see it as part of a, a grand bargain, uh, so a, a bigger deal, a grand bargain of, of policy coordination that needs structural reforms, higher investment, fiscal policy, and monetary policy. So without those additional elements, the um, ability of monetary policy to be effective uh, is very low. The last point I want to make is on confidence, and a lot has been discussed on this. And my main worry on this is that we see a period of increasing renationalization in economic policy making. And again, one of the good examples to me is the discussion we have on monetary policy uh, in the euro area, where we have basically 18, 19 national discussions. And the discussion in Germany, as uh, many of you know, of course, is very critical towards. Uh, the ECB monetary policy stance is very critical towards a QE program to purchase sovereign debt. Um, and very much with the argument, this would mean a redistribution of risk uh, for the German taxpayer. So it's again a very, very national perspective, uh, which doesn't help improve confidence, but quite the opposite, uh, reduces the confidence in European institutions. And clearly, if you're uh, an entrepreneur, if you're a private household, you see that discussion and that clearly um, uh, hurts uh, confidence and trust uh, and that ultimately uh, is to me the key uh, to overcome the crisis, to generate more growth and uh, great more investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, maybe I can give the floor to uh, Angeline Kemner uh, as a, a main asset manager. Yes. Yeah. How many billion are you going to put in that? <laughs> <laughs> Can I have the first slide, please? Uh, <laughs> uh, Guy, thank you for... Uh, Only uh, 100 euro. Uh, thank you for uh, introducing me. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, and I think my main message will be that, indeed, uh, we as institutional investors should be heard. Because um, it seems that a lot of people think that we should put money at work, uh, but a lot see this big pot of money without asking themselves, for whom are we actually managing that money? Well, the first slide is very clear. We are investing that for the pensioner. And those are, which we will see, but I would like to mention this, every 100 euros of pension money that you all want to have, 75% comes from the investment result during and before, but also after your 65 or 67 or 70. So it's extremely important for those individuals, it's not for me, but it's for, uh, and that will be the next slide, for five million people that we represent, 
as one of the largest global um, pension fund asset managers. And I think it's very important that to show that we are not a bank, to show that we are not an insurance company, and that we have other fiduciary responsibilities than that what a bank has or an insurance company. Every single euro that we have, we manage on behalf of somebody else. And that somebody else has put trust in us that we manage that money at, at their best interest. And I cannot stress that enough, although it's 400 billion euros, it is effectively between six and 800 euros per month per household as a pensioner that we want to pay today, tomorrow, and 30 years after. So I think it's very crucial if you think about investment gaps or investments or private sector, please do not make the mistake to put us next to banks and insurance companies because our fiduciary responsibility is completely different. So if we have to put money at work, we will have other considerations than banks. And it's very clear, and I will show you, but not right now, I will show you that. And it's important if you want to have our money uh, 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 do the work, then you have to also understand what, what our responsibilities are. And one of the reasons why I do a lot of lobby work, and yes, we will see Jonathan Hill next month, and we wore at IOSCO last month, and we wore at ESMA, etc., is to make sure that we're heard because we are too quiet. And I think uh, uh, the pension industry, but also the global institutional investors, asset managers, are too quiet. Uh, they're on your side, but we're not present ourselves. So I was really happy with the invitation to at least speak out loud and to make sure that you understand what we're coming from. Um, and last important point on this slide is, uh, two important points is, we are global. I'm sorry, Europe is nice, uh, but we're global. <laughs> and if Europe does not get their act together, then we go somewhere else. And we were very clear when we visited last year, we visited um, Merkel, Hollande, Obama, and Cameron, and we were very clear. We are your shareholders. What's in there for us and what's in there for our five million, we, we said that with huge amounts of money as assets under management, but what are you going to show for us? We want to have a fair deal as well. We don't want to squeeze you, but we have a fiduciary responsibility as well. And if Obama or his successor gets his act together more quickly in the public-private partnerships or Cameron, who are used to deal with institutional investors much more than the Eurozone. Let's be frank about that. We'll put our money at work there. Because let me also make the, uh, there is money enough. There's more than enough money. So that's not the problem, the problem is I'll come back to that later. The other thing is, um, well, I'm, you see, I'm very passionate about it because I feel, sometimes I feel that I'm on the defense side all the time. And I want to be a little bit more on, this is what we want, this is what you need to understand, and we can help each other. Um, second important point on this slide is, we are long-term investors. And then we turn to the next slide, because I need your help such that we can remain long-term investors. Let me just put a very short, simple picture, hopefully, of what we actually do. Uh, because we put in the 400 billion in many different uh, asset classes globally. Always think globally. You have on the right-hand side our fixed income, which is mainly for hedging purposes. It's for hedging our liabilities. Um, you see inflation linkers. I would like to stress that that's important for us if we want to hedge some of the inflation list. It's a bit weird to call that in a deflationary area, but we think 30 years ahead uh, um, and not for next year. 
uh, it's the, the real asset side that's important, which is equity and equity related. It's higher risk, but also higher return, which is very different from banks. If we look there, you have the liquid side, developed and emerging, but also a very important part is the illiquid side. And yes, there is room for infrastructure investments in our total portfolio. As also, I would like to mention real estate. Let's not only talk about infrastructure, but also about real estate. So this is what we need to do to balance our risk and return. And every single block has its own characteristics for risk and return. And I'll put you something you need to understand because you want us to invest in too risky infrastructure. For us, too risky infrastructure is totally not interesting. We have many other alternatives that are much easier to get at much lower cost with better risk return profiles. So what you typically see, and I want you to understand that, that if not the risk and return of the infrastructure projects fit our means, we just will not enter into the deals. If we can manage and structure the projects such that they meet our risk and return deal, uh, 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 risk and return uh, uh, profile, then we're more than willing to enter. If you see over the last couple of years, year or two, the infrastructure project with the right risk and return profile were all overpriced. We lost all of the tenders. And I can tell you it's extremely frustrating to have a whole team, a global team, uh, enter into 10 to 12 tender deals, which we want to change as well, and there, we, we got none. What a waste of money. What a waste of all the energy. So we will not enter deals that do not have the right risk return profile. So if it's too risky, we just don't even go because it takes us six to 12 months to prepare. So again, we want to do it. We want to work in infrastructure, but with the right risk return profile. The others, offshore, uh, wind with unknown technology, forget it. High political risk, we won't even do it. So what is hindering us? And where can you help us? Next slide, please. Um, we have established that it fits in our portfolio. But there are some threats here, and I want to mention them here, uh, and I'll mention them in every lobby I can get. If you put, and if you allow solvency two type rules on pension funds in Europe, we will not invest in infrastructure at all. Zero, like the insurance companies. I personally cannot understand that you have higher penalties in solvency two for infrastructure and real estate than for developed equity. I really cannot understand that. That's technical, that's model issues. But if you put solvency two on us, it's done. It's clearly done. We have lobbied successfully, but I would like to stress that we will continue to lobby. But even if there's a threat, you cannot imagine that I will enter into deals for 10 to 15 or 20 years where I pay high capital and unrealistic high capital requirements that's silly. That's not in the best interest of our participants. And the second problem, I leave the, the third. In general, there are many unintended consequences that threaten the amount of illiquid assets as a total that we can put in place. And the one is the quite disastrous unintended consequences on the single derivatives market. Because it requires way too much uh, and way more uh, uh, collateral in liquid assets than we've had before. So that's uh, at the detriment of uh, illiquid assets. So simply by unintended consequences in uh, uh, rules and regulations, you force us out of these investments. Fine by me, but those are consequences of other rules and regulations that you have to keep in mind. So I do think 
that we will continue to lobby, not on our behalf, but also on your behalf. If you want us to invest in infrastructure, well, you should help us a little bit here because otherwise we're pushed out of that market. And we will go out of that market because for us, it's a very costly, uh, labor-intensive uh, type of investments. What's the other problem? Next slide, please. And forget a little bit about what the slide says. Um, yes, important is the WW World Economic Forum ORC Infrastructure <coughs> Investment Policy Blueprint. Uh, we brought that out as a group of global institutional investors. I think we brought it out last year, and the executive summary is really pretty readable. Um, the biggest problem is, and I will come back to, to the uh, investment, the Juncker plan, uh, short, uh, uh, um, is it's darn difficult to have good investment projects. It's darn difficult to make good agreements between all the parties involved. And what we plead for is not the best risk return profile, but we ask a fair risk return profile. As I said, those are extremely costly and it's, it, it takes us so many months to try to put together a deal. And there in this blueprint, and please, please, please take it Take it with you, read the first five pages uh, and all the, the, the bleepers, I would almost say, all the terror pro, the Norwegian government, I'll just take the one I couldn't believe and thank God we didn't do it. Um, there was a Norwegian infrastructure product, it was actually great return risk profile and uh, one of our global institutions, there's a network of global institutional investors, about 30, so you could all know them all, I know them all. Um, one of them uh, invested in that. And it was a equity investment, expected risk, ret expected return 6.75%. That's okay, -ish. not great, but for low risk infrastructure, we're okay. It was a, I forgot, somewhere 15 to 20 year deal Six months after the deal had been struck, the Norwegian government, who has plenty of money, decided that they want to do a good thing for their Norwegian citizens and lower the gas price, which actually uh, uh, resulted in a lowering of the return on this deal to 2.75%. So they're stuck. This German institutional investor is now out of infrastructure investments. So we really need to make sure that's a fair deal for everybody. And we try to do our best to say from our side, it, and there is way too much political risk. There's way too much political risk. And the second thing is, but that's a detail, uh, tender processes are horrible. Uh, with real estate investments, we do club deals with like-minded institutional investors, and that works much better. And it's not that you get better deals with tender processes. That's not true. Almost, one to last slide, please. So, next slide. The Juncker plan, just, be, I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, some of the things that we need to do is clear all of the projects in Europe, with maybe the exception of Germany or the UK. The UK needs 250 billion, so that's sort of okay. Um, are too small. Pipelines are not good quality. And yes, what happens in, you get a crowding out. And I recognize that without giving you the details, I recognize that just not simply enough good deals. There are maybe many dream projects. Let me be so blunt but they're not truly good deals. Uh, and sometimes we make jokes about that. 
Tell us one. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't. There's actually one in the newspaper uh, uh, a couple of days ago. It's in the Dutch financial newspaper. I think it's good that we try to achieve to do something on a European scale. So what is certainly good is the new, fun, the new tools, the cooperation with the European Investment Bank. It's good to get the pipelines of deals and to assess the current regulatory environment. The political risk, if, if we cannot, what we should do is actually put in sufficient guarantees so that the political risk is taken out of the equation because otherwise it won't, it won't work. It just won't work. And again, I would like to stress that we, we would encourage to, to be in a hurry because the money goes there where, the, where basically the first country or region has their act together. It's as simple as that. In my conclusion, help us to remove potential negative impact of regulations. Um, and, and that's not a loose thread. We will stop immediately even looking at in infrastructure the minute the discussions start again. And I would actually reconsider uh, the Solvency II restrictions on infrastructure with, uh, with insurance companies. I used to also work and manage money for insurance company, and I've seen it taken down com completely. Um, please involve us because the next few bullet points are please take notice of us. We are not banks. The majority of us want to. Sorry, next, next slide. Thank you. Sorry. Please, thank you. Uh, um, involve us. We are different animals than uh, the banks, and we probably have more money. And we probably have more equity money than the banks. And, uh, well, I know for certain. Um, so also involve the institutional investors uh, within the investment advisory hub. And finally, cooperate with specific representations of organizations of investors. APG is a co-founder of the recently founded Global Infrastructure Investment Association. We did that because we we are chair of the uh, real estate investment association, but infrastructure is something differently. Um, the World Economic Forum has a group of institutional investors, all of it global, but you should want to deal with the global institutional investors, uh, where we care about how can we make deals with infrastructure. And finally, um, as a chair of the, well, this is my last month of being a chair of the Federa Forum of European Asset Managers. That are the European asset managers, 20 or so, and we think about BlackRock, Schroeder's, Fidelity, all of them, who also were not involved in the plans, in the Juncker plan, who say, please, let us, let us, give us the opportunity to help. So my plea is, um, we made steps in the right direction, but if you want us aboard, you need to take care of what our responsibilities are. And then I think um, uh, we are all in a hurry. Thank you. Thank you, Angeline. Thank you. Uh, Professor Reichlin, can I give you the floor? Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to participate to this conference. Uh, let me just start with uh, a question. I mean, what is the crisis that uh, we are fighting? Are we talking about uh, long-term growth, so about fighting the decline of uh, European growth, which uh, started before 2008, factors like demographic, productivity, uh, lack of uh, entrepreneurship, or we are instead fighting uh, uh, the fact that Europe uh, has performed much worse than the U.S. since the crisis, had a second recession in 2011, and actually is now going through a new slowdown, uh, which started in the middle of 2014. Uh, I think the diagnosis is important because the answers will be obviously different depending on the diagnosis. 
I will uh, um, s uh, focus today more on the uh, cyclical aspect because I think that this has been, you know, the focus of this uh, particular event. And uh, um, I will not talk too much about the investment uh, program because uh, I think, uh, and here I want to uh, insist on a point that already uh, Marcel has made, that the success on whatever investment program uh, will be eventually uh, in, you know, followed will depend also on the solution uh, of uh, the whole uh, uh, you know, uh, ensemble of the uh, policies uh, in Europe, uh, fiscal, monetary, and also the, uh, how to deal with the issue of the debt overhang. Um, so, all, uh, the slide, please. The second slide, I mean, I'm just going to uh, talk on the charts, if you, if you, okay, thank you very much. This is the real GDP year on year, uh, the euro area as a whole compared with the US. Uh, I'm taking here a very long term pr uh, perspective since 1981. What is circled in the red is basically what we are talking about. So we are talking about the fact that uh, the US had a recovery since 2009, not a brilliant one but, uh, you know, definitely positive growth, while we had a second recession and uh, a recent slowdown. Uh, if you can, uh, next slide, please. You can see here a zoom based on an indicator, uh, also compare with uh, uh, the euro area as a whole with the US and the UK, that this is an index. Uh, you can see that basically from the beginning of 2014, we have witnessed a second slowdown. So we are really thinking he, uh, seeing here something which has more to do with the cycle and therefore should be related to demand man management policies. There are three explanations uh, for, for uh, which, uh, on three explanations on the cyclical decoupling of the euro uh, with respect to the UK and the US. The first is monetary policy. The ECB has been too late to recognize, uh, for example, the decline in inflation and the deflationary threat. The second is the fact that uh, fiscal policy has been procyclical. Uh, of course, uh, this has been motivated by the need of fiscal consolidation, the debt issue. But, uh, you know, this procyclical policy has probably waited on demand and eventually been self-defeated on, uh, on debt stabilization. And the third issue is uh, uh, the fact that the debt overhang, so the stock of the debt here, not talking about the flows, is still weighing on the recovery because both private sector and public sector are still on the process of deleveraging and therefore they are slowing down demand. Now the key point of my talk, I have very little time, is that these three points are related and it is a mistake uh, to uh, not to, can, can you do the slide? Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, it is a mistake not to uh, analyze the three issues uh, together. And actually, analyzing the three issues together uh, is a way to understanding what are the, uh, you know, the barriers for more decisive action and uh, uh, also to get out of the, in my view, sterile discussion about uh, pro-austerity, anti-austerity. So let me try to argue this point. On monetary policy, just, uh, it, there is no, um, it, it is obvious that the ECB has been late in recognizing uh, the, uh, the, the inflationary threat. Can you give me the chart in two slides from now, please? Okay, thanks. Here is inflation, um, what we call head, headline HICP inflation, which the ECB uh, target. And uh, in those funny dotted uh, lines, uh, you see what has been at each point the forecast uh, of, the, um, of the ECB staff. So you can see that uh, it is uh, since 2011 at least uh, that uh, uh, the ECB has been too optimistic on, on inflation. So something clearly is missing in the analysis. The risk of deflation has been uh, uh, underestimated. The second point is uh, uh, the zero lower bound. Uh, as it has been already uh, uh, mentioned, uh, we are now in a situation in which a further decline in interest rate uh, are impossible. So uh, we are now at the end of the road. Marcel has uh, uh, recognized it. The market has paid quantitative easing. Uh, the uh, ECB is uh, undershooting the target. So not to act now will be uh, a big mistake. I think the ECB knows it. So the question now is not so much whether the ECB will do sovereign QE, 
but uh, what kind of sovereign QE will be done and what are the risks associated to that policy? And I want to spend some time talking about that. But let me just talk about, uh, give me just one chart on fiscal policy and on that, since I want to talk about the connection between these three things. On fiscal policy, slide, slide, thank you. <laughs> Here you have on the left, uh, government debt over GDP, and on the right, government de deficit over GDP. These are indexes, I'm comparing, and put it 200, the beginning of the uh, two other great recessions that we have uh, experienced, the 1980 recession and the 1991 recession. We can see that in comparison, uh, uh, the, the green line, both on the left and on the right, uh, is uh, the current recession, the one that started in 2008. We can see, especially, let me focus on the right panel, uh, that uh, as a consequence of the global crisis, we had a huge GDP income shock. So the denominator of uh, this ratio, deficit of a GDP, went down because of the global shock. And therefore, the deficit of a GDP spiraled up. And our uh, response has been that already in the third quarter of 2009, we have implemented as a whole, in the euro area as a whole, we are not talking here about the periphery, a very, very sharp uh, uh, decline in this ratio, which, uh, uh, you know, in terms of delta has no, uh, uh, you know, um, is not matched by any other historical episodes. Now, what has this done with, for the debt? And here I'm coming to the third problem, the debt overhang. So the stock, the weight of the debt that we've, we have inherited from the crisis. Here you can see on the left that the private debt of the financial sector as percentage of GDP, and on the right, uh, the public debt as percentage of GDP. There are two important points. One is that the adjustment in the financial sector started very late, only in 2013, for the reasons that we know. We didn't have a banking union. We, the banks were too, too large with respect to the sovereign. But, uh, you know, whatever the reason has been, that, okay, sorry, slide. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Whatever the reason has been, uh, you know, that's it, okay? So we had a very delayed the leveraging of the, of, the, of the financial sector, which is to be contrasted with to what happened in the U.S. So the recapitalization of the banks had been done in the U.S. in 2009. We have started only in 2013. This, in my view, has a big part in explaining, uh, uh, you know, low, uh, low, low credits uh, to, to the private economy. Uh, so... First point, okay, the adjustment has been late. Second point, uh, the public sector debt to, the GDP, to GDP ratio uh, of the euro area as a whole, if we compare it uh, to the UK, the US, um, it's actually low, lower, okay? But, uh, you know, it's not stabilizing. So you have to worry about two things, what is the level and whether it is stabilizing or not. So overall, the total debt in the euro area is not stabilizing. It is not stabilizing. I think this is a very, very important point. And the uncertainty that uh, we have been talking about uh, this afternoon is very much related about that problem. The uncertainty that the market, uh, uh, you, know, that, uh, you know, that put us at risk of these uh, risk on, risk off episodes uh, in the financial markets in Europe are very much related to that. So that's the third point. Now, these th three issues have to be analyzed jointly. The delay CB action, so the delay uh, to, you know, to, to go in the direction of sovereign QE is explained by concerns about moral hazard, very, uh, you know, very justified concerns, in a situation in which some sovereigns uh, may be considered insolvent. The second, the prophecy fiscal policy is motivated by the same concern. And the third problem, the debt over, uh, overhang, inducing the leveraging, uh, would require aggressive fiscal and monetary policy, but this cannot be done because of this concern. So we have to address the ensemble of these issues, maybe in a grand bargain, as Marcel has, uh, has been uh, suggesting. I've written about this also. You know, we need a new bargain. What are the policy choices? Let me talk about monetary policy first and uh, uh, talk about QE and not talk about uh, whether QE will be 
uh, will be uh, will have effect on inflation or not. I think there is no choice at this point uh, than not going to QE. We have some evidence on the basis of the U.S. Uh, that uh, depending on the details on how it is implemented, QE may have a, an, Im uh, an impact on inflation and exchange rate in particular. Uh, but the question uh, in the euro area is that uh, we are not the US and uh, implementing QE is extremely controversial. Um, if uh, uh, it will end up, uh, uh, we will end up in a situation in which the uh, ECB will have to implement a large QE program that would imply that the institution will have to buy a large proportion of government debt. Uh, okay, so uh, slides, thank you. Oh, this would mean assuming uh, a credit risk in the balance sheet of the euro system as, a, uh, as it is. So it's a, it's a distributional issue, okay, or how the credit risk will be distributed. Um, it will also mean uh, that uh, uh, if a QE will be unconditional, you know, that will make restructuring impossible in any state of the world because the Q QE would effectively mean that the ACB is insurance, the private sector, from sovereign risk. And uh, this would totally eliminate market discipline as the threat of debt restructuring would be removed. Okay, so this is the German point of view. I'm Italian, as you can possibly uh, probably guess by my accent, but you know, I want to be fair and put it up front. Okay, now, so we are in a situation in which we are dealing, so the, the ECB, uh, uh, on one hand, from the purely macroeconomic point of, view, point of view, has to go in the direction of QE because it's undershooting the target, and so it's violating the treaty because inflation is 0.3 and the target is 2% or just below 2%. But they have to deal with a paradox. On one hand, in order to limit the redistributional effect on monetary policy action, the treaty has designed rules which impose legal restriction on, uh, uh, on the ability of central banks to assume fiscal functions, which uh, you know, is uh, roughly speaking QE. And uh, also via the no bailout clause, uh, you know, we limit cross-country sharing uh, of fiscal risk within the union. On the other hand, when the union is under pressure, like uh, you know, when we are at the verge of, uh, of a debt crisis like we have been in 2011 and possibly now with the Greek situation, the ECB is called to defend the common currency uh, and uh, you know, in, uh, to prevent uh, you know, either exit or default. Okay? So this is a paradox because when the ECB intervenes, the, there is either too little or too much. Because knowing that ECB will ultimately defend the euro, the market will expect that that is implicitly guaranteed by the ECB. And this is actually the reason why long-term interest rates have been so low in the euro area. But this doesn't mean that they will be low forever, okay? These are low now because the market, you know, has uh, expect an implicit guarantee from the ECB. We will see now with the Greek crisis if this will continue. So I think that therefore, for any QE program and not to be a purely uh, monetary financing operation, it is uh, crucial for the ECB to design a plan uh, which will have the double objecting of not killing all market incentives while uh, providing monetary stimulus. Now, of course, the ECB is an independent institution, so nobody can tell them what to do. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, this is basically a matrix uh, which characterizes uh, the internal discussion as I understand it and as us, I think, as European citizens, uh, have, you know, we have to monitor it. So basically, we can go for the U.S. option so that uh, we will buy uh, the, uh, sovereign bonds according to the capital key, so German bonds and Italian bonds, et cetera, according to, you know, the GDP weight in the union. And, uh, you know, and, risk, and share the risk within the balance sheet of, uh, of the ECB. So this is option six. So it's, uh, it's the option which would be natural if uh, we didn't have this issue of trust that, that we talked about. But of course, uh, you know, that would mean, you know, to, to, uh, to assume credit risk, which is controversial. And therefore, there are all these other uh, different options. Oh, another option is, for example, to buy uh, uh, according to the capital keys, but then let each national central bank, uh, you know, support the, uh, the, the burden of the risk. Eventually, that would be the national taxpayer, the national fiscal authorities. But then if we go in that direction, then we can instead of buying according to capital key, we can uh, uh, buy according to market uh, capitalization, for example. So you see that there is a big bunch 
of options, and whatever option we will chosen, uh, it will say a lot about what is the future of our institution. So this is, I think, is something which is very important uh, to, uh, to, to, to monitor, because uh, it is not just an economic issue, it's also a political issue of so what are the directions of our union. Now, there are other proposals to go forward. Uh, well, I have one uh, which, uh, uh, with a colleague uh, uh, from uh, the London School of Economics, uh, which says uh, you know, that in the medium term, we should also think in terms of changing the regulation. So we should st uh, uh, think of a change in regulation so as to incentivate banks uh, to hold uh, both sovereign, uh, sovereign bonds, not only of their own state, uh, but uh, you know, a diversified bunch of uh, sovereign bonds, which will uh, uh, break the correlation of risk uh, uh, between sovereign and banks, which has been one of, of the problem of the adjustment uh, post-crisis, and at the same time provide uh, a safe asset uh, for QE, uh, for, for monetary policy, okay, which is uh, what the, uh, the euro era lacks, uh, uh, lacks at the moment. So for that, I think that uh, on the regulatory aspect, I think there is a room for, for political initiative. It's not just ECB initiative, it's also you know, political initiatives. Um, let me just uh, finish. Uh, uh, okay, so this is for what monetary policy. Now, what about fiscal policy? Uh, well, I mean, the fiscal policy, uh, we, ideally, uh, we would like to have a coordination between central bank and national fiscal authorities, but, you know, this is a little bit of a joke, right? It's very, very difficult. It's already difficult to coordinate monetary and fiscal policy within one state, within one state sovereign. It would be even more difficult uh, in our union. So an alternative, and here, you know, I'm really thinking in, in a very academic way because I don't think there will be a consensus for something like that, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, you know, thinking in, uh, at least in the academic circles. The alternative uh, is to implement the fiscal monetary coordination via the ECB with a specific form of QE. That would imply to have, uh, you know, to implement not temporary monetary QE, but permanent QE via outright purchases of sovereigns, diversified, as I explained, and associate that with a nominal GDP target to say we will continue to do until we reach a level of nominal GDP which is consistent with the treaty. This is equivalent uh, to a generalized tax, tax cut, uh, which uh, you know, the, the single sovereigns don't, uh, don't, don't know how to implement, also because of the, of the constraints of the stability path. But I think in, in a situation of which uh, heavy the leverage uh, and, uh, and stagnation like us uh, will be very justified from the economic point of view. Of course, you know, again, this is a slippery road. It will require a new grand bargain involving uh, a mix, uh, maybe, of debt redemption, debt rescheduling, uh, and uh, also, you know, demand stimulus uh, in exchange for reforms. And I think that sooner or later we will have to go there, because, and here I come to uh, to, to the last slides. Uh, no, it's not that the last slide because I checked. Greece, the keyword. Okay, thank you. So I think we are now uh, with the Greece crisis again uh, on the, uh, you know, be, uh, again being uh, relevant. Uh, I think this is a very good example. The fact that Greece has uh, uh, maybe the intention, the, the fact that Greece is, insol is insolvent and maybe uh, uh, is going to the road of. Uh, asking for some new, uh, you know, uh, sweet deals on the problem of his debt, makes it difficult for the ECB to go in the direction of sovereign QE. So you see that there is a, rela a relation between the debt overhang problem and the possibility of having effective and timely monetary and fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. But, of course, the issue is, uh, will the ECB reschedule that part of the debt, uh, which is of his concern, what the, the IMF do, and so on. So, again, I think we have to go towards a multilateral deal on the legacy de de debt. We have a model, which is the London Conference on 1953, so I, uh, I very much support the idea of everybody sitting at the table 
and uh, look at that model in which the Germans uh, uh, actually uh, had uh, negotiated, also with, uh, with the help of the Italians, which were mediating uh, at the time, uh, they got that redemption, red redemption, so, uh, because when there is a debt crisis, uh, it is quite natural that the creditors and the debtors sit around the table and uh, try to negotiate a deal which would enhance growth, which is for the advantage of both parties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, Paul de Grau, Professor Paul de Grau. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very happy and honored to be here, to be able to talk uh, about um, economic issues that confront us. Um, as you know, there is this joke about economists, uh, many jokes about economists, but one is that if you put three economists in a room, there will be four different opinions. Now, we are three economists here. Shall I say three economists around the table? Um, I don't know the background of all of them. Of, of he, I know, is extremely interested in economics, but he's not an economist, right? Fortunately. Uh, and, and you are not one. Uh, the other ones, I, I, I think uh, the Minister of Finance is an economist, right? But anyway, let me stick to the three economists that were invited in the panel here. And I, I think um, there will be no four op different opinions, but one and a half. Um, opinion. So I, I, I share most of what has been said uh, by the um, previous panelists and the way I would like to, uh, to bring it here is as follows and a little bit like uh, um, the previous speaker has been doing. Um, the way I see the, the, the economic problems in the Eurozone is one is a long-term problem of growth, right? Uh, we have a long-term problem of growth, which has to do with uh, all the features we know. Population growth is declining, uh, unadjusted labor markets, insufficient R&D, also dramatic collapse of public investment right, that uh, reduces long-term growth potential, as Marcel has emphasized so much. So that's the long-term dimension, which is basically a supply-side problem. Then there is the short-term problem, the cyclical problem. Um, and, and there, um, the striking fact, as um, has been illustrated in, in the previous graphs, is a, is a lack of aggregate demand that has led to a situation where not only the Eurozone is lagging vis-a-vis -vis the US and UK, but when you look at the Eurozone and compare to the non-Eurozone EU countries, you find a similar pattern, that is, since 2012, the growth of GDP in the Eurozone has been about two percentage points lower than in the rest of the EU. So here we are, the Eurozone was supposed to bring all these goodies, and we are now in the worst part of the European Union in terms of economic growth. The origin of that is also known, I think. It has to do with the fact that uh, we are still experiencing the sequels of a balance sheet recession, excessive debt accumulation prior to the crisis, and the need to deleverage um, by the private sector um, uh, since then, and the overhang that this has on consumption and investment decisions. But I would add to that also uh, an inappropriate macroeconomic policies and budgetary policies that have been pursued within the Eurozone, where too many countries at the same time have been forced into austerity programs, not only the, the periphery countries that have been forced in extreme austerity programs, but also the rest. And as a result, no compensating um, stimulus existed and creating a deflationary bias um, in the Eurozone, especially since 2012, right? It's a cyclical phenomenon. So this is really a demand side problem. So we have this long term and this short term problem. Um, we have to deal with both. Um, the first one has to do with supply side and structural reforms and all these things. The second one has to do with demand management. And in fact, if done properly, can have relatively quick results while the, the long term things that are structurally takes time, right? So, therefore, I would say the, the imminent problem today is the 
short-term problem, the demand management problem, without forgetting that we have to do all these other things also. But we have to get the Eurozone out of this deflationary um, trap that it has been pulled into uh, by the combination of factors that I've uh, brought forward that, that, that continues to maintain high unemployment and increasing debt burdens. Um, where, because the denominator um, does not grow fast enough, um, we get, in fact, uh, an inability to stabilize debt burdens. And we, in, we, we are stuck into this vicious cycle in which we have pushed ourselves into. It's not something that has fallen upon us, but it has been the result of inappropriate macroeconomic and budgetary policies. So we should, in, as a priority, I think, now try to deal with the demand side uh, equation. And how to do it? Well, here again, and I, I'm totally in, in, uh, uh, in agreement with the previous speakers, it has to be a mix of different things. It will not be just one. It has to be a mix of monetary and fiscal policies. On the monetary policy side, I think we have had a, a brilliant uh, expose about the role of the ECB. Um, let me just say a few things about this. Uh, what, what strikes me in this whole discussion about QE is that what in other countries is a purely technical matter, right? If you want to expand the money stock, you buy government bonds. In fact, when I was taking a class of monetary theory and policy, that's, that's what I was taught. What is open market policy, right? Well, that's the privileged tool of a central bank to increase liquidity. And how do you do it? You buy government bonds. And it's a purely technical matter. In the US, this has become an ideological matter. Right? And I think we should try to get away from this. I, I realize it's going to be difficult. But it's going to be difficult mainly because there is so much distrust. Right? Um, the distrust about um, what should be done is, is so high that it paralyzes the ECB. In fact, it shouldn't be difficult to buy government bonds. It's the easiest way to do it, right? Because all the rest that has been tried, it's much more difficult. The markets for all these collateralized loans doesn't exist yet, and it's technically difficult while getting into the government bond market is very easy. But we are so much... Um, constrained and paralyzed by a lack of trust and a fear of some small fiscal transfers that paralyzes the whole thing, and that makes the ECB unable to, in fact, achieve its own objectives. So um, all I can say is that I regret this, and uh, we have to think, and, uh, and, and, and uh, I, I think it's very important um, to, to design features that, that will overcome uh, this distrust. On fiscal policy, that is, again, monetary policy alone will not do it. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Fiscal policy. Um, as the previous speakers have, have shown with, uh, uh, with, with a lot of data, th there is a lack of investment, private investment and public investment. Concerning private investment, the best way to stimulate private investment is to stimulate consumption. Right? Um, when people consume again, then firms will become optimistic and the negative animal spirits will tend to disappear. So it's not really a financing problem. Too much focus has been put on financial tricks to do it, while it's again a matter of confidence. And how can you create confidence for firms? Well, if they see that people buy, that there's consumption again, then uh, I think investments will also start moving. So the question then is, how do you stimulate consumption? Now, one piece of uh, good news huh, is the decline in oil prices that suddenly create uh, a large increase in purchasing power, a relatively large increase in purchasing power in the oil-consuming nations. It's equivalent to something like one or two percent of GDP extra stimulus uh, that is being created there. So I think we should exploit this because that has the potential of 
um, stimulating consumption, and we should exploit this by um, trying to do a little more, a little less austerity, right? Try not to kill whatever uh, stimulus that could come from, from this source by, by applying too intense austerity. So let's get away from um, this, this approach that has been so destructive and, 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 and give some possibilities for consumption to start growing again. On public investment, just a few things that I want to, to say about this. Um, there is indeed a huge need of public investment. There are gaps in the public investment. And um, the plan, the Juncker plan, is a, an attempt to redress this. But it, my, my fear is a little bit that the Juncker plan doesn't know whether it wants to deal with a short-term or a long-term problem. Um, it's sometimes um, presented as, as a way to uh, deal with the short-term lack of demand problem and sometimes as a way to deal with the long-term structural problem. I think it should focus on the long-term structural problem and not the short-term demand um, stimulus thing because we know that the implementation lags of, of um, public investments and especially at the European level are so long that we cannot possibly hope that this can become an instrument to stimulate aggregate demand. It should be primarily an instrument at stimulating long-term growth potential of um, the European economy, and especially in the Eurozone in this particular case. So I think that is uh, uh, key. And, and in that connection, it, it should be willing to focus on public investment. I mean, here you have a plan that says, we, the public authorities, are willing to put in of our own money 20 billion. And we hope you guys, the private sector, will come up with 280 billion. But these guys in the private sector are, so, are going to say, but if you are not willing to put more than 20 billion of your own money, how do you expect that we will come up with 280 billion? So we have to redress this imbalance. And, and public authorities that believe in good investment projects should be willing to put their own money in there. In other words, they should be willing to borrow, right? But there is, as you know, a kind of taboo for public authorities to borrow. So I think we have to overcome that. And that brings me then to my last point, which has to do with national investment plans. And, and here, I would also like to, to, to go against some of the taboos that we have created and now institutionalized, right? We have created institutions now that make it more difficult for national governments to invest because the, the fiscal compact and the, the requirement to have balanced budgets over the business cycle make it extremely difficult for public authorities, national public authorities, to, to use investment and to finance it by bond issue as a tool for long-term growth. It, it's made more difficult. And I don't see the, the rational reason for that, right? It's a self-imposed constraint that, in my view, does not make sense. There is no reason why public investment could not be financed by debt. In fact, it should be financed by debt. If investment is productive, and I do believe, as Marcel um, also has stressed, that public investment can be very productive, right? Then um, it should be financed by issuing debt because it's a way to spread both the benefits of the investment and the productive assets that are created to, between the present and the future generation and the cost of doing this, right? That's the way you should do it. That's the way, in fact, private companies do it. I mean, suppose we were to impose on private companies the rule that investments can only be financed by current revenues. Where would we be today? In the Stone Age. Right? Yet, it's a Stone Age rule that we impose on public government, on public institutions. It just doesn't make sense. But we have so much distrust again, right? Against each other. Um, and, and, and as a result, we have imposed rules that make it very difficult 
to do the right thing, to do the rational thing. So it's time that we get away from this. I, I know I'm talking as an academic. I have no illusion whatsoever that this will be changed. But again, I want to stress the need to introduce something like a golden rule at the level of national governments that allows these governments to finance public investment by issuing debt. There's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with uh, doing productive investment and financing it with debt. That's what private companies do all the time. It's not because some private companies have issued too much debt that we tell all private companies from now on you can only finance investment by current revenues. That's what we do with governments now because some governments have been foolish, have issued too much debt, therefore we say all governments now should finance investment with current revenues. It's not a good rule. It's bad. It's bad for long-term growth in Europe, and we should get away from this. So some kind of golden rule, I think, is important to, um, to clear the road towards better economic prospects in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. So before opening the floor, uh, I have learned in any way of uh, uh, Professor uh, Fratzer, that there is an investment gap and that, that he is everywhere. Uh, so maybe also in Germany, uh, this big in, in investment gap. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Anthony Kemner, that yeah, in, in this whole debate on, on investment for the institutional investors, the politi political risk is the main, uh, the, the main uh, one of the main uh, uh, problems. Uh, on uh, of, of uh, uh, Professor uh, Reichlin, that quantitative easing. Well, I see described it. I, I had some idea. Oh, that's like that sounds the debt redemption fund where we were talking about a few years ago without using uh, the word uh, because with the senior senior trench you enter really in the uh, in that uh, in that uh, proposal, but using the ECB instead of a of a fund uh, to do uh, that. And from, uh, from, from Paul de Grauwe that also uh, 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 on a short term, uh, fiscal uh, stimulus uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, absolutely uh, necessary besides the investment, uh, uh, the, the investment tool uh, we uh, uh, create. Uh, maybe the only thing, but I'm an old minister of, uh, of budget that I'm a little bit different from him. If, if, if debt uh, is, 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 is basic for, for growth, then we should have an enormous growth for the moment because all our debts. So uh, that, is, uh, that's, uh, uh, that is not the case uh, today. But that's, another, that's, uh, that's our fundamental uh, uh, <laughs> debate that... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, so I, I use simple arguments, not so difficult as, uh, as economists are doing. So, uh, but that said, I, I think that we got a huge important uh, uh, contributions uh, from, 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 from everybody. I open the floor and it's Jean Artuit who is uh, doing the first uh, introduction. Jean. Merci, Guy. Je voudrais d'abord te féliciter. Thank you very much, Guy. I'd like, first of all, to congratulate you on having organized this debate and congratulate each and every one of the keynote speakers. S start of the year is very stimulating, and I'm sure 2015 is going to prove to be a crucial year. Now, on the investment side, that the investment plan that the President of the Commission has put forward, I think it's a very interesting plan. What I'd like to know is what the role of the EIB is exactly. As the minister said, we are looking at the issue of project bonds and then accredited the idea that we have an active market in Europe and then the market could take over those operations. The EIB wants to maintain its AAA rating and that makes it a little more tricky so there's going to have to be risks undertaken and obviously a commitment, a budgetary commitment from the European Union to stand guarantor there for the risks taken. Does everything have to go through the EIB? Or 
could we imagine with the EU's backing, uh, another bank would be able to be involved in the mobilisation of private capital to facilitate investments, the ones that we're looking for? That's my first question. And then I have a more general observation on the question of indebtedness. The problem often is that states are indebted not just for investing, but also for financing their standing bills. And that's what you need for your current account. And on the Juncker plan and on conditionality, I'm just wondering, because sometimes I think if certain states hadn't entered the Eurozone, maybe they themselves would have been able to carry out the structural reforms that they've postponed because the market would have forced them to do that. But as soon as you have the euro, then you've got this general uh, amnesty. The euro inspires uh, confidence. The market thinks, well, despite the bailout clause, if there's any problem, the member states will pull together to come and help out those uh, member states who are passing through troubled waters at the time. We saw that happen with Greece. So in other words, is our type of governance not just a way of, uh, of numbing the need for reform? You know, looking at the way the Deutschmark or other currencies had worked, you are putting off the structural reforms that are required. So have we not reached the limits of the treaties? Do we not need to come back and look at a European Union government, uh, more notably a government in, in the Eurozone? How can we trigger the structural reforms which have been put off year by year by some member states and which overall are, are dragging growth across the board and probably affecting their confidence necessary? So. Vice President, what are the tools that you intend deploying to convince certain states to finally knuckle down to the structural reforms that are necessary? Because where there is a lack of competitiveness to push those structural reforms into the limelight, companies are not going to invest because there's no real perspective of getting a return on their investments. The problem of financing SMEs is a problem of profitability. I don't know any profitable company that can't find the funding it needs. Uh, uh, maybe uh, I may ask you to respond to that, and also maybe to say something about your position, the position of the Commission on the Grexit uh, debate that we have. I think that many of the people are expecting that also. So I give you the floor, and then it's our Lithuanian colleague who is the next intervene. Uh, intervene. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, the EFSI is separate to, uh, from, from EIB. So the EIB's challenge, or EIB has been working very well, but because of the fact that it must secure its lending capacity, it must maintain AAA rating. And this has been problematic in a sense that EIB has not been capable to invest in riskier projects or the countries who can, who can be considered uh, being riskier than maybe some others. So that's why we wanted to establish EFSI. It has its own capital separate from the EIB and, and the risk from EFSI to EIB is limited. So the EFSI can take more risk. So that's why I, if I understood your question right, I, I think the new structure is needed uh, and, and uh, it will not jeopardize the AAA rating of EFSI. I, I was very strongly uh, keen to find a solution to this problem because um, um, uh, I, have, um, I know quite well the Portugal uh, and, and I have been wondering why the private money doesn't go to go to profitable projects in Portugal, even though we're supposed to have kind of a borderless market for money. But uh, but because of the country risk and because of uh, many many risks, the money didn't go there, even though the projects themselves uh, were profitable and reliable. So that's why the EFSI could help private sector to to. Um, 
uh, go to the places to which it cannot go because of many reasons. Um, what are the tools to force member states to do necessary reforms? Um, we have one tool which we have not used uh, that much. Only Rain actually knows probably this problem, uh, problematic uh, or this issue very well also. It's macroeconomic imbalances procedure. We should uh, focus more on structural weaknesses of our member states and also uh, threaten if needed by sanctions those weaknesses. This is very, I mean, nobody likes it, but uh, we have this opportunity, which we haven't used. We have been stri uh, stricter with uh, fiscal rules than macroeconomic uh, balances uh, related issues. And now we know that at least 50% of the reason why we are in crisis or some member states have been in a crisis, it's more structural in nature than uh, fiscal policy related. Of course, they usually go hand in hand, but. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, structural, weak structures usually uh, destroys uh, the foreign trade, first of all, and, and employment uh, in the second row. So macroeconomic imbalances procedure could be used more. I don't know what are the opportunities to create more uh, tools. Maybe we can devise something, but they are not on the table at the moment. About the Craxit, um, it's the speculation of increased exit from Eurozone is a waste of time. The membership in Euro area is irrevocable. And the Commission is fully committed to, uh, to, uh, to integrity of Euro area. So um, what we need now is uh, stability. If somebody says that instability is better for the growth, I would disagree very strongly. So I wouldn't like to create any homemade problems or crises. We have had those already during the last few years, too many. So whatever we can do in order to stabilize the situation, including not to speculate about things which are not uh, feasible or which are not helping us to attract private sector investments. So. In liberal democracy, you can speak whatever you want, but, uh, but I would like to concentrate on attracting private sector to use their money for profitable investments, because uh, it's a pretty condition to get jobs, and I believe the society in which people can work, because I happens to believe in the value of work. <laughs> so the correct speculation functions totally to totally different direction with this these aims. So a strong commitment to Europe uh, and broad support among Greek voters and political leaders for necessary growth-friendly reform uh, process is essential for Greece to thrive again within Euro area. Greece has needed European citizens' help. European citizens have helped Greece and Greece has given commitments and I'm very sure that ordinary Greek citizens want to uh, respect their commitments towards the other European citizens. Thank you. Yeah, colleague from, uh, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Vice President, I think we're making a mistake by not having an opportunity to enter and to leave, right? So if, if, you, if you have a chance to enter, you always have a chance to leave because we choose to enter the European Union and Lithuania wanted to leave the Soviet Union, but we were not allowed to leave the Soviet Union. So let's not make that mistake. And we, we all have to be responsible uh, to state the fact that if European Union starts to fail, it fails, it doesn't work. Uh, Lithuania will want to leave it. I can guarantee you. And every member state will, have to, will want to leave it. And we need to have an opportunity of leaving. And we need to have very clear rules. And I think you should think about how that would work. Obviously, it's very improbable, but it's going to happen. It's only a matter of time. I can guarantee you that. For sure, a member state will leave at some point. It might be 10 years. It might be 100. But whenever it happens, it's going to happen, and we have to be ready. And we need a mechanism in place for that. It's, there's no question about that happening. Uh, the, the, the other question in, in regards to quantitative easing, 
and and thank you for your comments. I, I don't think we can look at the success of uh, the Fed and America because they're buying a different instrument than what we're selling. I mean, Greece's uh, yield, 10-year yield, is 20 times higher than the German. Uh, 10 against half a percent. So the risk is 20 times higher. Now, we, we, can, we need to have a very clear mechanism of how we help member states. And as a Lithuanian who are now part of the Eurozone, I would feel uncomfortable of our money, which we took massive, we took massive cut. We took a 15% GDP cut by, by making these uh, reforms, which were very painful. No one helped us. We wanted to enter the euro. We entered the euro. We don't want to spend our money on bailing out Greece if they're not prepared to make the changes, the structural changes, the employment changes that, that all of Europe badly needs. And I think we need our quantitative easing in Europe attached to reforms. France needs reforms too. Look at the debt. I mean, they have to be prepared to make very difficult reforms, maybe take a big hit. And sometimes we, we shouldn't be afraid of losing some GDP on the short term for the long term benefit. Once you clean up and you take the pain, you take the pain now, it's always better than taking the pain forever. Now we've, we've, we're talking about a lost decade. It's very true. We've lost a decade. Do we want to lose a century by not taking the pain, by writing down some of the debt, perhaps? But we need very, very concrete plans of how QE is going to be used in Europe. And Lithuania is a very small, minor country. But we took a very brave step. And we need, we need the Commission to act very responsibly and all of, all of government to act very responsibly. We're asking you for that. And we're asking you for a plan of how you will buy our government debt and how we invest in Lithuania too and in Estonia and in Spain. Everyone needs, it's a different situation in America. We should not just think that we'll go and buy and, and expose our, have a massive exposure but not have any benefit to that exposure. Uh, Philippe de Bakker, and then I'm I, I, I going to take two, three uh, interventions together and then I give the floor to the panelists again, okay? Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of comments and also a couple of questions from my side. Um, I thought the panel was really interesting and, and, and really was a good start of the debate and a lot of ideas floating around, but the, the one thing I, I, I missed a little bit from the debate was, was the following. I mean, we have identified the problem, eh? we have... Uh, too high debt from the public and the private side. We have uh, lack of trust. We have lack of structural reform. Um, we have the investment gap, for both from the public and the private side. You clearly saw it in the slides that were that were shown. And of course, now the European Commission, as it should do, is focusing on what the public side can do. They're creating this fund. Um, they are trying to attract also private investors with that. But on the other hand. Where's the reform on the capital markets? Where's the reform on attracting more private investment? Where is, because the investment gap will not be bridged alone by the 300 billion that Juncker is proposing. It will not be bridged by a thousand billion that uh, others are proposing, but it will be bridged by allowing again also private investment to come in. And I think this should be really at the heart of the debate. How can you restore the trust? How can you make sure that uh, international companies, which are, for example, through corporate bonds and other instruments, are raising a lot of capital, how come they're not doing that for Europe? How come they're not doing that in Europe? What is the, the, the regulatory framework or the conditions that are absent or not present in Europe today that are disallowing them to do this kind of investment? And I really enjoyed the, the intervention by, by um, Madame Kemma from, from APG saying, look also at this side of the, of the equation because I think there, there will, there's a lot more potential. So I think that was for me a little bit the missing link of, of, of the whole debate is also how can you stimulate again private investment? How can you make Europe attractive again? How can we also stop talking so negatively about Europe, because I think we still have a lot of potential there. We need indeed to do more on, on, on uh, research and development, on innovation, on bringing companies to the market, on entrepreneurship. It goes hand in hand with the structural reforms that is needed. But in the end, we're not a bad continent. Eh? I mean, we still have a lot of uh, uh, export surplus to many other continents, for example, so we must be doing something right. So I think also there, a little bit of optimism and a little bit of trust can help a lot. And also making sure that we are not only looking at the public side of things, but also enabling private investment, maybe e equity investment also there on that side to really boost the economy, mainly on the, on the middle long and, and long term. I think that's a much more fruitful debate than just focusing on only the public side of things.
Okay. I want you to pick up where Philip uh, went, and it's actually going back to Ms. Kemmer, and it's a question about trust. Surely one of the problems in Europe at the moment is that there is a distrust of the regulatory regime, which should be overseen by the Parliament. And I just make a very specific point. There was a study recently that suggested that European, European companies have of the order of one trillion lying on their, on, on their, on their books. Now, Ms. Kemmer was making a, a very, very good point that nobody is taking into account uh, this, this problem, uh, particularly in regulatory checks. For example, in the impact assessments which come to the Parliament, you very seldom see the regulatory impact that you're going to have on investment. And it seems to me that questions she posed and was posed by the, the final speaker is where does the money come from? It's there. And you have to break the cycle of distrust by looking better at how we regulate. And I'm just wondering how the Parliament can do that. Thank you, Dick. Uh, Thanks, uh, thanks, Guy. Uh, I think uh, this has been a very good start for the for the new year and uh, very substantive discussion. And uh, I take uh, take away very much the same things as uh, Philip was saying about uh, the uh, the legacy debt and uh, its uh, burden on growth, uh, as well as uh, on the on the investment gap, uh, which was underlined by several of the of the speakers. Maybe two points: uh, one uh, one for the economists uh, and uh, the other one for the politicians, or at least uh, for the Commission Vice President. Uh, the first one for the economists, uh, in a sense that, uh, as I have uh, top economists uh, here in the, we have uh, top economists here in the panel, I think uh, it's uh, good to use the opportunity to recall that uh, it was probably a, a collective uh, failure of the economics uh, profession 20 years ago when the Economic and Monetary Union was uh, designed uh, that uh, too much focus on, was put on uh, the optimum currency areas and uh, the production structure, what kind of uh, problems that would uh, create for the functioning of the, of the Economic and Monetary Union, which in fact has not uh, materialized uh, in a sense of uh, those kind of uh, asymmetric shocks uh, as, uh, as we expected uh, when we were talking about uh, the Texas phenomenon uh, in, the, in the future euro area at the time. Meanwhile, uh, uh, the economics profession uh, underestimated uh, the impact of uh, financial flows uh, and uh, uh, the mispricing of risk. Uh, and uh, this was uh, a major contributor to the large and uh, unsustainable imbalances uh, that uh, accumulated uh, during the first decade of this uh, millennium, especially. And uh, now we are, in fact, uh, overburdened uh, because of this uh, imbalances. Uh, we have a very severe debt overhang which is uh, functioning as, uh, as a drag on growth uh, on at least uh, half of the Eurozone because we have uh, very different <coughs> situations within the Eurozone among different uh, member states of the, of the Eurozone. And um, I would uh, agree, tend, tend to agree with uh, Professor Reichling that uh, we have to deal with uh, the issue of uh, legacy debt uh, one way or another and uh, we have to find a way along the lines of, uh, of a debt redemption fund uh, or something like that uh, so that uh, we can reduce this uh, excessive uh, debt burden that is uh, hindering uh, uh, growth and uh, job creation in, uh, in Europe. My second point uh, concerns uh, the functioning of the investment program of, uh, of Juncker. I think uh, Paul de Grave pointed out uh, rightly that uh, at least in theory the golden rule would, uh, would be useful in practice, uh, its uh, operation would be extremely difficult uh, to monitor by the Commission, and I have some difficulties to believe that uh, it would work uh, within the Member State, uh, at least uh, within the frame of the Stability and Growth Pact. Uh, but in fact, uh, you can do it at the European level so that uh, you will, uh, you will um, um, exempt, uh, as was discussed uh, by Minister Sturek, uh, you would uh, exempt uh, the spending on the European Fund strategic fund for investment uh, from uh, the stability and growth pact and that actually works as uh, as a golden rule and you don't have the measuring problem which is uh, inevitable within the member state uh, national uh, budgets but then comes the question to to uh, Yurki concerning uh, leveraging which is an important element of this uh, this program you assume that uh, the member states uh, would be willing to contribute uh, 
quite substantially to the fund, uh, and I think that's a right, uh, right objective. Now, however, in the latest uh, European Council, uh, several member states uh, declared uh, very clearly that uh, they are not uh, willing to contribute uh, to this fund. Uh, so does this uh, undermine the chance of uh, leveraging? And uh, for instance, uh, are you disappointed of the fact that uh, your successor, Prime Minister Alexander Stubb, uh, and his government uh, has uh, rather resorted to a nationalist uh, reflex uh, than a European solution by not supporting your investment uh, program, which uh, would certainly help uh, growth and uh, jobs in, in Europe. Thank you. That seems to me Finnish politics now. Right? <laughs> no, it's <laughs> European voice. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> but good question. Eh? Yeah, uh, yeah, very okay. good. <laughs> so I, I have taken uh, yeah, the Anita, and then uh, I, I take this too, and then I give to everybody in the panel the possibility to react. Well, I start with uh, mm. with you, Yuki. Yeah. So, eh? mm. uh, but uh, we have yes, please. And then Danuta. Mm -hmm. Danuta is last one. Yeah. Uh, honourable members, ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is Deborah Newton Cook. I am a British Liberal Democrat, centre left. So you know, toss a coin to say you was more liberal than me. Um, my question concerns. I mean, it's been a brilliant seminar. I must say, excellent. So thank you for everybody for their contributions. Um, two, two quick points. One, um, I'm sorry, sir, but I fundamentally disagree about um, indebtedness. My daughter is 11 years old. She gets five euros pocket money per week. When it's gone, it's gone. Irresponsible lending leads to irresponsible spending. So, as the gentleman over there who's now left, I think, um, we should stick within our means. And if we have to deal with austerity first, then we deal with it first. And then when we save the money, then we spend. Um, now, where do we spend it? One, research and development, that's essential. Europe has always historically only invested something like 2% of GDP in, it's, it's pathetic frankly. Japan is at 10%, states 7 or 8%. If we don't invest in R&D, we're going nowhere. Now, who's going with the money? Well, the most shocking statistic I saw today was the one on education gap. Because if we don't invest in our young people, where are we going? Now, if we're not careful, we get a brain drain. Because if we don't, if we invent but don't innovate, then it's the Americans who innovate and the Japanese and the Koreans who innovate and our people will just disappear with all the investment in their heads and go and make their money elsewhere outside of the EU. So how do we keep, how do we up the expenditure on education? How do we up the percentage spent on research and development? And how do we keep all that knowledge in the EU? Thank you. Thank you. Danita. Uh, well, thank you. I, I, I understand that this, this year is going to be difficult because we will have to match well in terms of timing a lot of new policy measures. And I, I was also impressed by what Madame Kemna said. And I, I would like just to, to ask probably her and, and also the Vice President of the Commission uh, because my understanding is also that quantitative easing will take place and uh, whatever it designed, but it will take place. And if I understand correctly, the, um, uh, Madame Kemner, that quantitative easing might push uh, the investors into, into new classes of risk, might, might push also the investors abroad to, to foreign assets. And th that's why we have to have a sort of good, good timing between the, this the quantitative easing stimulus uh, that would come on the one hand, on the other hand also the investment opportunity that the commission program is supposed to create, which I think is a long-term investment uh, program. So if we have, if we, if we don't have the solvency to amend it, uh, if I understand correctly, and if we don't have this at the same time, the, uh, the investment opportunity created by, by Commission working together with EIB and uh, hopefully, as Minister Shurek was saying, also with Member States, we might lose this opportunity. That's why I think that this timing is something that is very important. And my second question uh, goes to Professor De Grauw, who was, 
my, I, I liked very much your, your academic courage when you were talking about the golden rule, but could you also look with, with the same doses of, um, of courage to the monetary policy uh, of, the European, of, the Euro, of the European Central uh, Bank? Because we clearly uh, see, I think, that uh, the, the, the inflation targeting of the policy uh, is, is, is not delivering. We, we, we see very clearly that it's too narrow, that it does not allow us to see all the complexities of, the, of all the markets, financial markets, uh, that would bring the results that the, the policy is aiming uh, at. So would you, would you think that this uh, formal targeting, uh, inflation targeting regime, this is something that requires a kind of rethinking uh, today and that we could uh, have the reflection also on, on, um, uh, on this. Because in any case, even if we have formal regime uh, for, uh, for the policy, uh, at the same time, it's always the discussion and it's always aiming at, at a consensus within the ECB. So it doesn't matter that it's a formal regime. So do we really need it uh, in such a narrow understanding that this inflation targeting as the basis for the monetary policy when we see all the complexities which, uh, which in fact make this policy up to now, we don't know about quantitative easing, but we might have no effects either, so, uh, or maybe not expected effects. So we are in a situation where it doesn't work simply. It was created in different times for different situations, not for the 10, 15 years of deflation, which the ECB is saying, if you look into the forecast for inflation. So is it, shouldn't we be more open to, to have a change here as well? Thank you. So uh, first of all, I give you the floor, and then uh, I give the economists, <laughs> and then start with Paul, the floor. <coughs> and the only politician here, uh, the, minister, the Polish minister, uh, is shall conclude. Mm -hmm. Shall be the last, uh, the last, uh, the, the floor. Please give. Thank you very much. First, very shortly about the capital market union and and the Peter Singer market in in cattle. It's quite amazing that the European consumers cannot use the property as a collateral if you are getting financing from the other countries. This is the case for all of those or us who tries to buy an apartment here in Belgium and Brussels and, and, and could get financing from the home country. Um, this is just one of the examples uh, in which we have some restrictions. It's not easy to change but uh, nevertheless, there are things like that which, which could be changed in order to create better market. And this, I, I believe in this kind of thinking very much because uh, uh, it's, it, uh, it creates much more than we can imagine if we manage to regulate or deregulate right things. Um, about the leveraging, we wanted to build EFSI so that it could function without any member states' contributions. It was a principle. Of course, if member states want to participate, it would, uh, it would upgrade the lending capacity. But uh, um, the leverage ratio, it's quite easy to count. 21 billion capital uh, enables EFSI to raise uh, some 63 billion from the market and lend it further. So the fresh lending capacity is 63 billion. And according the EIB's historical data or, or result, this 63 billion could mobilize around five times more private investments. But no one can guarantee this. And also, when we are talking about riskier investments, uh, the leverage ratio can be, I mean, I don't know what it is. Well, um, actually, the average, um, or, or if, if looking very carefully, the EIB's historical data, the leverage is eight times not five. I used my uh, capacity to reduce the leverage tracer because uh, I didn't want to use exactly the same figure as the EIB's uh, historical data has been. I wanted to, in order to keep the credibility of the fund, I wanted to use five instead of eight. But again, okay. no one can guarantee this. But if, of course, it would be very good if member states would like to participate because uh, because, um, I mean, then we would have more risk money, especially for the SMEs, which are lacking for, for risk uh, financing. Um, and about my uh, successor, Alexander Stubb, who has only rarely 
been uh, called nationalist. <laughs> Uh, everybody who knows him <laughs> maybe may know. Um, he and the other leaders in the European Council meeting said that they um, they don't want to make commitments right now. They want to know technical details about the FSI, 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 and also the governance structure is important for them. And we promise to provide a legal text of it uh, by 13th of uh, January. So hopefully then we can, we can get final contributions. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm going to change a little bit the order because the minister has to catch a plane to Poland. So that uh, is a good excuse to give you the first floor. And then uh, I give it to uh, Angeline and then to Paul. Well, thank you very much. And uh, as because I'm not the last now, I can just turn on my economist hat instead uh, and maybe support uh, Professor De Krauwe a bit, uh, answering um, uh, the intervention about the, uh, the savings first and, and then thinking about other things. Uh, now, th this is the classic fallacy of composition that, you, that you're talking about. You can't really, on a macro level, apply the household economy uh, rules uh, because in the end, you'll have everyone saving the money, uh, becoming poorer and being more burdened by debt uh, than in the first place. And this, this is something that's been going on in the Eurozone uh, for quite some time, uh, and I, I gave you the example of um, uh, uh, of Poland over, over the past seven years. It's not the question of the nominal level is the uh, of debt. W what really matters is whether you're able to service it, whether you're able to pay it back, uh, and that is a function of the health of the economy and the size of the economy. Uh, so if the, uh, if the investment is productive, if the investment is leading to a um, uh, to higher income, uh, is the same in the company, the same in the, in the economy, uh, then you are uh, better off and your debt is being less of a problem than, than in the first place. Uh, so th that, that is, um, uh, I, th I think this is, this is the fundamental uh, problem within, within Europe. This is why we're talking about investments and not uh, not about um, um, about savings in general. Uh, so, um, and, and and that that also applies to the to the questions about uh, how to stimulate private investments. Now, uh, well, of course, at the margin, there is a lot to be done in terms of financing, uh, restarting or creating uh, a proper venture capital uh, uh, market in in Europe. Uh, catching up with um, uh, with some other areas in in the world and also contributing to higher research and development spending um, uh, as a side but you know fundamentally the question is why should a private investor um, and by, by investor I mean someone that actually builds physical infrastructure or, or, uh, or human capital whatever uh, invest more uh, if it's uh, if its capacity is um, is utilized in 50% and fully meets the demand that, that, it, that it sees in, in the European market. Uh, and without that, no amount of extra funding, uh, without changing this fundamental problem, no amount of extra funding uh, or, or plumbing uh, of the financial system is going to change uh, things for the better. And this is why uh, the, the initiative of, of the Commission is uh, is important because together with um, together with uh, with public um, uh, investments, private investments follow. Thank you, Minister Angeline. Yes, I don't have the excuse of catching a plane, but I do a train, have a train. A train. train oh, a train. train! I have do well, have a, a dinner it meeting in. Uh, the train may be too late. No, no, so no I have a dinner longer. meeting in Amsterdam. <laughs> so I I hope you excuse me of. Uh, being brief and slide away in order to have that obligation as well. Um, I do have for later reference two of my experts, if you just wave your hands there. Uh, if people have more concrete questions, they will stay on uh, if there are more concrete questions. Um, I'm very happy with the comments that I got, that you do realize that uh, some of the regulatory unintended consequences uh, will lead us away from Europe uh, and totally unnecessary. And probably had you known, you would have taken uh, 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 other actions or, uh, so therefore I think we're there to help each other. 
again, it's for our European citizens as well. So as long as we try to align goals, uh, that works very good. Uh, just for that first question, QE easing is short term. That might lead to short term actions or reactions. To be honest for us, that's not that important. But having to have solvency too, that's there for the long term. That will have a, a, a huge impact as it had for the insurance companies. So I think we should really distinguish between what we call tactical movements uh, and the really strategic ones that can lead to substantial shifts in, uh, in investments. And, and we really talk about those bigger movements. I don't want the same goes for the derivative markets. The change in the derivative markets will lead for us and for the insurance co companies to huge changes in investments. And those will almost by definition hurt investments in Europe. Um, and that has nothing to do with, that not even has to do, stupid enough bit, with the companies in Europe. It has to do that we are punished so much, and then there's global alternatives, and we're working for the same European citizens who want to have a good pension. <coughs> so, for more, again, technical questions, please pick up the experts. They're also here. One is here in Brussels, located as well, because we really want to make that noise. Thank you. Thank you, Angeline. Paul de Grauw. Thank you. Just a few points that I pick up from the discussion and, and the debate. The first point that I want to address is Brexit and what I understand to be the legalistic approach of the Commission. It's illegal. Therefore, we don't talk about it. I don't think, and I, I uh, second what uh, um, this gentleman has been saying, I don't think that's the right approach. I mean, le let's not forget that the decision to be in a monetary union is the result of some cost-benefit analysis, right? And if countries join, they must have come to the conclusion that they will be better off in there. If after years being in there, and countries find out systematically that it's not in their national interest anymore to be in the Eurozone, they will quit it. And there's nothing you can do to prevent it. So therefore, we have to make sure that the Eurozone provides economic benefits. And today, it has to be admitted, it does not. Right? Be, to be in the Eurozone today creates an economic handicap for the countries involved, on average, right? And, and I think we have to redress this, and, and we have been talking about this the whole time, and, and that, that's the way one should deal with it. I would also like to react to a point made by Oli Rehn about um, collective responsibility of economists. I remember uh, when there was this discussion about uh, whether or not to form a monetary union, in Europe, collectively, the economists were against it. There were exceptions, but on, I mean, there was certainly a majority of economists, especially those that had an Anglo-Saxon background, right, who were saying, don't do it. It's a bad idea. It will lead you into troubles. I remember in the early 1990s, I was invited one day to the European Commission, was preparing a, a big report on the goodies that the monetary union would bring. The decision had already been taken, but this was supposed to be, and it was called later on, one market, one money, right? And I remember the first meeting, and there were economists there around the table, and some of us expressed doubts about whether or not the monetary union would be such a good thing. We were not invited anymore. <laughs> so that at the end, a Darwinian process had been set in whereby only the enthusiasts about monetary union were kept around the table and produced a fantastic report about what monetary union would bring in terms of more growth and what have you. So I'm not sure there was a collective responsibility of 
economists there are certainly, yeah, I'm not saying that there are no other areas where economists have made big mistakes, right? In particular, in financial crisis that we have seen there, surely economists have made big mistakes. But in terms of monetary union, I would argue that that is the area where most economists said it's right. But politicians took over and they said, you economists with your cost-benefit analysis, you don't understand anything about this incredibly great project that we are going to, to, to start and, and stop being this uh, shopkeeper, having this shopkeeper attitude of trying to add up costs and benefits. It's a great project. It became a political project and now we suffer from it. It was from the beginning a political that's project. That's right, that's right. So that, that's what I wanted to say, um, but uh, um, I, I appreciate your comments. Finally, there was a question about the ECB and inflation targeting. Should the ECB have a formal inflation targeting regime like, I guess you mean like the, the Swedes have, the, U, the Bank of England has? I guess, yes, I would, I would like that, but I don't think it would make much difference today. Um, we just, we, the ECB has some target, implicit inflation target. It has announced a 2% rule. It's not a symmetric rule like in other countries, but it fails to achieve it for other reasons, not really because it's not the kind of uh, explicit inflation targeting regime like the Bank of England uh, has, but for other reasons that we have been discussing here today. Maybe there can be the good bridge to uh, Professor Reichlin on that, on, on that issue of uh, uh, changing the, the, the mandate is on a yeah, um, just briefly, I had interpreted your question in a different way. So you want more flexibility, not, uh, uh, not less flexibility, as it would be implied by the inflation target. I think that uh, the ECB now is extremely flexible, so I think that it's not clear what are the rules that are changing, but uh, uh, I would be actually, if you want uh, independent central bank, you need to have simple principles, otherwise, uh, you cannot have independent central banks. I mean, it's at the core of the idea of independence to have rules uh, which can be monitored by the parliament. So I would uh, not be very sympathetic uh, with excessive flexibility. I think, in fact, maybe we have too much flexibility now. Let me just uh, answer also to uh, the question from the Lithuanian member of parliament because he was on QE. Uh, you say we are not like the US. Indeed, we are not li like the US, but not for the reason you say. Uh, Greek bonds are very risky, but so were mortgage-backed securities when uh, Bernanke bought them uh, in the height of the crisis. Uh, they, the Federal Reserve ended up making money for its, their own treasury by buying uh, those uh, securities in a market which were virtually dead, 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 okay? So we are different, not because of the risk, but we are diff uh, different because the risk is geographically colored, and uh, therefore, you know, when it, uh, you, uh, there is a redistribution issue which has uh, to do with uh, sovereigns, so with, uh, you know, the, the risk of the members, and we don't have a fiscal, uh, fiscal backing. So, uh, I want to insist to the main point, uh, buying bonds uh, of, of, a, of a virtual insolvent state, it is monetary finance. This is something that has, uh, has a problem that may kill incentives, and uh, so incentive to reform. Okay, so that's the issue we're discussing about. Uh, so it has to be very well defined, I think, because you know, it's not just risk in general, it's risk uh, of some sovereigns. So does this mean that we should not do QE so that we should be different from any other central banks in the world, the UK, Japan, and the US? I think that would be very dangerous. You would put us in a very uh, dangerous situation. So the point of my talk had been, uh, let's try to get a comprehensive approach, which would, uh, on one hand, uh, you know, allow us to go for uh, expansive policy without killing incentives, so some form of conditionality. And on the other hand, deal with the problem of the debt in a realistic way. And I think that we have been in a war, through a war. There was the 2008-2009 crisis. We should treat uh, that problem coming out of that crisis as coming out of the war. That's the issue of the legacy debt. And we should have a realistic approach. So that is a problem when you cannot service it, as the Polish minister has uh, uh, recalled. 
So we, if we kill growth, we'll never be able to, to, to service it. There are, uh, uh, and if we, at the same time, we say no bailout, no exit, no restructuring, we are putting ourselves in an impossible situation. So I think this, uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem that pops up and then disappears from the debate. Uh, it's not very fashionable anymore because we're discussing about investment, but you're not gonna get any investment unless you solve this problem because that will mean that we will continue to live in uncertainty. The market will ever doubt about our possibility to clean up the mess once the mess arrives. We have very tough ex-ante rules and we have very, very relaxed approach once the mess uh, is with us. Uh, and there, we are ready to all kinds of flexible deals, including restructuring without calling it restructuring. So I think it would be much better for our democracy and for our community to deal with this approach in a realistic way. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor, Professor Fletcher. Just uh, two, two replies. One to the Lithuanian member of the European Parliament. Um, you said, oh, you, you, you joined the euro because you were expecting uh, benefits and um, now um, you, you're worried about having to pay for, for costs that come from the Greek debt restructuring or, or something similar. Um, and so essentially I, I understood your question as saying, what's in it for us? If you want to join euro, we want to, want to have the benefits. And for me, that's actually exactly the wrong question to ask. It shouldn't be the question what's in it for us, but it really should, uh, and I, th I think that's exactly uh, the difficulty we have in uh, a lot of the European discussion on economic policy, that uh, policymakers take more and more national perspective rather than a European perspective. Now, joining the euro, for instance, has big benefits for a country like Lithuania in terms of stability of the currency, in terms of interest rates, but clearly it also comes with costs, so they always have to be uh, weighed against one another, and Paul de Glauber put this very nicely. Uh, so clearly this means if we have a joint currency, we just don't all uh, share the benefits, but we also share costs, we share risk together. Now the second point that is very important is if you talk about monetary policy and QE, this is essentially about reducing risk for everyone. So it's not about a trade-off. Every monetary policy has a redistribution effect. Some benefit more than others. Um, in Germany, we are very worried about uh, QE because it essentially uh, transfers risk from other euro area countries to the German taxpayers. That's at least the perception uh, of a lot of people in Germany. I think that's exactly the wrong perception because it reduces the overall risk the ov and improves the overall stability uh, of the euro and the uh, euro area overall. So I think that's what we should be focusing on. And if you look at profits, for instance, of the Bundesbank, you will see uh, because of the risk the ECB has been taking, uh, the Bundesbank profits have been at record levels uh, for a number of years. Second point in reply to, to Paul de Graube, and I think there I would disagree with you to say for a lot of countries in the euro area today, the euro area of the euro has become a handicap, has become a liability. And I, I think I would strongly disagree with that because uh, the euro has been really a, an anchor of stability during the crisis, it had not been, has not been a liability. If you look at countries like Italy and Spain, you could ask, would they, they're paying about 2% on the 10-year government debt today. Would they pay the same cost, the same price on their debt if they did not have the euro? For sure, Italy and Spain would pay 10, 12% as they did in the 1990s, with levels of debt that was much lower. So the euro has really been an anchor of stability that has allowed to prevent a worse outcome, a much deeper crisis uh, for all of the euro area. So I think we're making the euro as a scapegoat for policy mistakes that have been made in other areas that have, not been, that have nothing to do with the euro. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's the same, this is true not just for Greece and Italy and Spain, but um, it's also true for Germany today. So I there would, would strongly disagree. I think the euro is really, um, an anchor of stability and a benefit, uh, in particular in the global uh, and in the European uh, crisis. Okay. Uh, you want to come in, Paul? Yeah, just uh, st stability. Stability towards a bad equilibrium is also stability, right? Um, the fact that Spain has a relatively low interest rate is is not the only dimension to to look at this. If you I've, I've done a little paper um, revisiting the pain of Spain uh, where I compared the UK and, and Spain. Uh, yes, indeed, now the interest rate is the same in, the, in Spain and the UK, right? Um, but Spain, being in the monetary union, has been unable to do 
what the UK has been able to do, depreciate its currency, create some inflation, and stabilizing its debt-to-GDP ratio. UK, in fact, first has experienced the faster growth of its debt-to-GDP ratio, and now stabilized it because the denominator has been increasing. Spain, because it's a member of a monetary union, has had great difficulties of doing so. That's part of being in a monetary union, and that's part of the cost-benefit. And I think when you go to these countries, people feel it that the, the euro zone has been putting so many constraints on them, and the outcome is a macroeconomic situation that is significantly worse than outside the Eurozone. So I, although I, I'm not saying that we should blow it up, I mean, I, I think I, I want to keep it, but we should not be blind. We should not be blind for the real problems that this mechanism produced and, and the deflationary dynamics that it has been, that, that it has set in place, and we should get out of this. That's may maybe my conclusion. It has to create also collective responsibility, collective solidarity, uh, and we are not always ready to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, that that's, that's the reason why I agree with Paul when he said it's a political decision was the euro, and we started with the euro without a number of tools and instruments. Uh, today we know that we need them, and, and, and it's true that in the past a number of people have said, yeah, you need that. Mm -hmm. so we're going to create them later on. First of all, we take the decision, and then spontaneously they shall be created. Now we are in the spontaneous phase of creating these tools. Eh? That is what we are in. Uh, and that shall still uh, till, uh, take some time. Uh, but uh, it, it, it is, in my opinion, no sense to have a monetary union if you have not all the other tools, because then you have only the negative effects of a union and the lack of flexibility and the impossibility uh, to depreciate and not the positive uh, ones, to have a common strategy, uh, a, a more integrated market, and, and uh, certainly in the areas where we are talking about. So, but, okay, I cannot reopen the whole uh, debate. I want simply to uh, thank the panelists, and especially, if you allow me, uh, to the economists here around the table, <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Katainen, uh, the Vice President of the Commission, uh, to be here. I think it was a very useful uh, conference because for the first time we have uh, not only talked about uh, the monetary union, the euro, but also ECB, quantitative easing, and the link to the, uh, uh, the, 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 the investment uh, uh, gap and, and the programs that shall be launched. And it is, it is very clear uh, that it, it's a multi-track uh, uh, approach uh, what is needed. Uh, in the monetary field, in the fiscal field, and in the field of economic uh, investment, and that the fastest as possible. So uh, let's conclude me on that note, and thank you for your uh, uh, presence, and also to the press who was uh, uh, present here uh, today. Thank you. <laughs>